Welcome to Looking for the Ocean, a Pixar podcast, where we talk about everything that Pixar has ever made and what it means to us. I am Mark Young, and with me as always is Danny Vincent, and with us today for this very special episode is Tessa Wittenhofer. Hello! Tessa, how are you doing today? Thank you so much for coming on with us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm doing great, you know? Went to Costco today, so killing it. <laughs> Oh my gosh, another Costco guest. What did you buy at Costco, Tessa? Uh, got croissants, got some milk, rotisserie chicken. Uh, what else did I get at Costco? I don't remember, honestly. No worries. Happy Mark. to hear that Costco is such a big part of our lives uh, as uh, people who record on the show. Danny. One of the highlights of my week. Uh, I, I'm mm-hmm. so bothered by you, Mark. Because you said, how are you doing? Instead of saying the obvious question, which is, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Have you been sitting on that one? Like, absolutely not. No. <laughs> we walked uh, right into it. So, yeah. All right. Why don't you ask that, Danny? Yeah. What's up? Okay. We well, already answered this, though. So there's no real point to me asking it. Maybe we should. Well, you can introduce yourself. Or unless you want me to introduce you. I mean, well, Tessa. <laughs> Yeah, Tessa, do you want to tell us, the people, a little bit about you? Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I am a human being. No Whoa. shit. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> and Danny and I play D&D together with friend of the show, Caleb, just about every week. So, full disclosure going into this, but I feel like it fits because of how I act in D&D. I am he- heavily medicated right now. Uh... Because I think I forgot to take my allergy medicine last night, and as such, the whole day I've been going through a terrible migraine. Ooh. So, I I thought it was because I was hungry, but I also took like my sinus medicine. I actually forgot to take my allergy my my night allergy medicine. That's okay. I'll just have to remember to take it after this because I'm on my day allergy medicine, and I'm also on an exergen, ex exedrin. You know, yeah, my high I, I can't ever say Excedrin, it. Yeah. Excedrin? yeah, that thing, yeah. I always yeah. say estrogen for some reason. I don't know why. It's just <laughs> Those not, are it different comes, things. Yeah, they are. But yeah, yeah. So if I seem a little out of it, that's why. But don't no, worry. I'm still here to fight fun. about Pixar. Punch, punch, kick. Great. I'm <laughs> glad that we're going to fight. Ah, whoa, I'm... Uh, oh my gosh, it worked. <laughs> you punched my audio interface off my laptop. Ah. Uh, all right, come back, Mark. Come back. We miss you. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> All right. So, Tessa, how did you first encounter Pixar? One of my literal first movie memories is being 2003. So I was four, seeing Finding Nemo in the theaters and having to leave because at the midpoint, my brother and I were just sobbing hysterically and <laughs> 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 because we were four and three respectively. And we just had to leave. My brother, um, one of his special interests throughout his entire life has been film and especially animated films. And so a lot of my childhood was me sitting in the living room reading a book while he sat at the computer watching the same film trailer over and over and over again. So I very much got familiar with like that part of film as much as I was with you know, watching movies and all of that sort of stuff. And so Pixar was a very big thing at when we were kids. And mm-hmm. in high school, I dressed up as the Pixar lamp during homecoming <laughs> week one time. It was That's a Disney good. themed homecoming week. And it was a Pixar themed day. And there's so few good characters to throw together a costume for. And so the lamp was the choice. And like, it should have been good. It, it's always been a thing. What? Yeah, what year was that? I'm trying to think if there there really weren't a lot of, like, human people for a while. My freshman year of high school was 2013-2014. And so it's mm. like, it's so not old. that you had no one. <laughs> yes, I, I, yes, I am, I am baby. We all, we all are aware of this. But it's not that there the were... The listeners aren't, but go on, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in 1999. Uh, but yeah, it's like, it's not that there were no human characters at that point, but it was just like, the ones that were there were not ones that you could 
easily toss together a costume for. Certainly not one mm -hmm. that fit Catholic school dress codes. Be civilian Elastigirl. So the, 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 yeah, but no one's going to get... That's the only option. Civilian Elastigirl. Yeah, you you basically had civilian Incredibles characters, and Andy's other mom. than that, like, Boo. Oh, yeah, Boo Boo's makes more sense than Andy's mom. And other than that, you had to spend a decent amount of money to get creative. Versus no, so white sweatpants, Hold white hoodie, white card stock, headlamp you already own. I've got to ask, this is not related to Pixar. Did you also, like me, do Catholic school up through high school? Yes, I did Catholic school all the way until college. Yeah, preschool mm -hmm. all the way up. Same, same, same. I was, this is while we were talking earlier before the episode, I was like, man, our lives like really line up in a lot of like, we both like didn't have cable and all these things. And I'm like, ah, yes. Yeah, because I sent a SpongeBob reference earlier and you're like, I don't know what that is. I didn't go to Catholic school. But I went to school in Indiana, so it's practically the, the same thing. I'm not Catholic. <laughs> I mean, that didn't stop a lot of people. I don't know if you knew that. That's true. I don't know how Catholicism works anyway. It's, um, it's very interesting hearing you talk about Catholicism on your other podcast. What? Oh, just, yeah. I, I haven't know, actually listened just... back to that episode. Usually I listen back to those episodes as soon as they're out, but I haven't done that yet. Yeah. Well, Too Tessa, busy catching I don't up know. on Succession Recap Podcasts. Sure. Um, I don't know. If you, it's, I don't know. They just, they whatever watch the day. movie. <laughs> I'd rather listen to you talk than whatever Succession nerd you're listening to. <laughs> I'm glad that you're listening to Succession nerds. They just, they did an episode on the Snub Club. There are their, I don't, do you listen to the Snub Club, Tessa? Uh, I listen to a lot of planning about the about. Snub Club. Ah. Uh, because well, we usually have one... D&D &D like a day before we record. So yes. we're, we're putting it together. <laughs> <laughs> you like work it into the dialogue of your D and D campaign. You have no idea. You know, we, we should probably at some point tangent to talk about D and D here, because I think it'd be a good conversation to have. That I'm even though I am heavily medicated, I'm still much more sober now than I am normally when we play D and D. Danny has incorporated <laughs> so many things into our D and D canon that I don't think Caleb ever would have imagined. Uh, including currently. but not limited to everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah. I was going to say, Is currently it... my my character I've been playing for like a year has been put on sabbatical because they are writing a musical adaptation of everything, everywhere, all at once, but it's called Nothing, Nowhere, Never. And the way I always do these bits in the game is that I'll just switch actors' names. So I'll be like, we're looking at Yashelle Mio for the lead. <laughs> I'll just say that in the game. And okay, we'll be like, okay, I guess that's somebody in this world now. This is true of everyone except for one exception. Iconic actor yes. of stage and screen, Mandy Patinkin, who is yeah, just Patinkin actually is... canon in-universe. Yeah. He he works with the crumpets, which the is Muppets. great. The Muppets. Yeah, the crumpets are the Muppets. <laughs> the Muppets. And Mandy Patinkin works with them. <laughs> it was something where Caleb meant this to be a one-off because I almost always forget details of our game but yet Manny Patinkin being there is one of the few things I remember so I'm constantly like maybe we should call it Manny Patinkin for help and Caleb's like no it was supposed to be a one-off what's like the world of your campaign is it like old fantasy and it's old fantasy just... yeah very... do you know nothing about our campaign no. That's Oh, well, I started a cult. That's the main thing. No. Yes. <laughs> One of Danny's characters started a cult based off of my character, who was not <laughs> into it. Uh, yeah. Because we had a sparring match, and she accidentally killed me. I so know. she brought me back to life of a potion. I was like, oh my god, you, could, you saved me. So I started a cult about her. Yeah. It... How she brought me back to life. Yeah, it's like a very traditional old fantasy type of setting with a lot of Caleb twists to it. So lots of very interesting lore going on. But also, every once in a while, we just do the stupidest shit you could ever imagine. Like, make Mandy Patinkin a character. Or fight the director of the Eternals. Wait, did we fight her? I forgot that we no, fought you, I, I know, you I, know I can bring fought her up. Her. Oh, yeah, you're right, you're you, right, right. Yeah. I, I ran into her at a, a party, karaoke party, if I remember right. Uh, I'm surprised that Caleb hasn't, like, killed you somehow. Uh, see, see, I, 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 like I started my own plot. In... 
I started my own. I started my own plot to kill off Reggie at one point, where I started doing this plot where it was like split, but he had it because someone said he was cool and called him Reg. He's like, and I was like, oh, the Reg, and I just did my Jeffrey Wright impression the entire time. I was like, hello, my name is the Reg. I think my Jeffrey Wright impression is pretty okay, but. Then eventually what I did I, was it's funny because I would do this thing just, where, that I completely made up for it where it was like you'd I'd roll to see if I was the Reg or if I was Reggie in the scene and then eventually I was like the Reg is getting tired of this so the, he went to get Reggie exercise from his body <laughs> and so I retired that character for a bit and I mm-hmm. came back in as Ange who was a bohemian it was Cool. Playing with right Danny. Up, I saw tick, tick, boom. <laughs> Playing with Danny is truly unlike anything else. You genuinely never know what you're going to get. But we're going to combat. I'm probably going to start falling asleep. <laughs> I'm going to be like, ah, just hit it. <laughs> hit the guy. I don't care. Got next. Although recently, I... I didn't I throw like uh didn't I throw like weenies on someone recently? You, you threw churro oil. Yeah, next time yeah, you should play oil. like a barbarian or something. I feel like that would suit your play style very well. This is my other sticking point with D&D because I feel like you have to have such a like an active personality to to be in it. Like that would be my thing because I feel like, Danny, I'd be worried about I don't know. This has just been my experience when I'm in a little group of people because everyone's like, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this. Because I feel like the stereotype of D&D players, and this is, of course, not true. Like, we all know this, but you're kind of, like, socially shy, nerdy people. But it has been my experience in D&D, and you may have talked about this while my internet was down, that you have to, like, be able to jump in and defend your position. Because otherwise, you'll get, like, I don't know, you just, like... Other people get to run your your character's campaign, and you want to run your campaign. So, well, has, see, is that like maybe, maybe we should have like a discourse of this when like Caleb is on, and <laughs> like maybe we can have Tessa and Caleb on at some point to discourse this. But I feel like I definitely hijack our D and D sessions a lot. Yes, <laughs> because I'll just be like, because Caleb will be clearly trying us to go to the story. I'll be like, mm, I want to like start like. Well, I want to check, like, back when we had a call, I was like, I want to, like, start, go to the library so I can write up, like, a manifesto for my cult. <laughs> or, like, or, like, um, well, back when I was like, playing Ange, Ange would always go to the bar to try to get laid. And, like, I would play that out and be like, roll the dice to see if this charisma works. We, you know? I think we equally derail the campaign, but in very different directions, which is Danny will go and have a character do his own thing that's like very usually pretty comedic very wacky my characters my character tends to equally take up time and space and slow things down but uh, you're like diving into the actual lore yeah no i'm doing (laughs) i treat the game as an excuse to do drama uh and like there was one time after a session, everybody left except Caleb and I, and we did an hour-long role-playing scene between two characters, and it was just, like, this intense, dramatic conversation. But going to what you were saying, Mark, I don't think you need to be... The mileage is going to vary table to table, but if you are a person who isn't initially comfortable with, like, being very forthright and being, like, very bold and active... If you're able to communicate that with your table and, you know, acknowledge that that's a skill you're trying to work on, they will provide you with the opportunities. And so I play with other people other than the group with Danny and Caleb, and we are very mindful of, oh, this person's been very quiet and it's not because of a technical issue. Let's drag them into like let's go do a one-on-one scene with that one person or let's make sure to ask them hey so and so how how do you feel about it in character and so Mm -hmm. different tables are going to have different environments around that sort of thing but i think that like any other friendship the best ones are going to see how you like see you as you are and try to bring out the best in you and try to bring you in rather than exclude you. 
Or you can play like me and like try to start infighting. <laughs> I'm sorry. You can use D and D to test friendships and make them stronger that way. My my character has threatened to kill Reggie so many times. Everyone was mad when I brought Reggie back like a couple months ago. <laughs> They're like, can you just give him Ange? I'm like, no, Ange is, Ange is pursuing their dream that has never once been brought up in this entire game that we just added to their character list and we have to write them out quickly. <laughs> we weren't mad. It's just that we all liked Ange. And so it was just like... Ange was a little more grumpy. And like Reggie gets grumpy, but like in a very stupid way. Ange got grumpy in like a man, just shut up type of way. <laughs> like leave me alone. I want to just be alone. Like in more of a I don't know, more of a realistic way than anything Reggie ever does. But Ange also <laughs> was like very was like capable of having dramatic conversations, which I liked. That's very true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It depended. It, it still always depends on my mood when I come in, but also it's really hard because of how Reggie's set up to ever play Reggie in series. <laughs> the intro, the uh, influence for Reggie is from the good place. I don't know. If, I think you've seen it, right, Tessa? No. Or at least bits of. Oh, Mark, you've seen it. Well, it's um. No, because that would be behind like Paramount Plus or whatever, wouldn't it? It was on Netflix for a while. Now, I don't know if it still is, but it was on. But anyway, it's Jason Mendoza's character. Um, well, it's Manny Jacinto's character. The name of the character is Jason Mendoza, where he's like a total idiot, but sometimes he'll say something smart, but then it's like, it's that joke where the stupid person says something smart, right? So, you know, like, you can't, you can't play a character like that smart, because then it's just a joke that they're being intelligent for one scene. That's basically what I mean. So, before we ask the next question on our thing, we, I always like asking this, even though it's not on our list. When do you think you left Pixar? Because I think everyone walks away from Pixar for a little bit. Yes. At some point. Unless you're like me, who's obsessed with them their entire life. Which seems unlikely. <laughs> Finding Dory, I believe, is the last one that I saw when I was seeing every single one. If I remember the film order correctly. That's pretty late. Uh, so that's pretty good. Mm, yeah. yeah. Sure I, wasn't Good Dino? No. Sure it wasn't Good, good Dino oh, was the one before. Oh, that's Good Dino. <laughs> yeah, I might just have the timeline wrong. I didn't see... Okay. Yeah, because I saw Finding Dory and I saw Toy Story 4... Is Coco before Good Dinosaur or after? After. Okay. Yeah, Good Yeah, good Dinosaur then. Because I saw Cars 3. I'm so sorry. No, I... It was perfectly serviceable. <laughs> I'm, I'm very anti-Cars 3. It's one of my, my big takes. I'm ex not a fan of Cars 3 at all. I could not <laughs> bother to care. I took my brother to see it, and I wasn't upset. I was. Are, so I, I was in the theater opening, and I was like, we gonna throw hands, army hammer. You're much more of a long fan than a lot of our guests have been. And I want to ask, how, what's your like relationship to Pixar? And what do you think when you think of Pixar? I mean, when I think about Pixar, I definitely think about... I think about like the stuff between like Incredibles and Inside Out. The stuff where I was like aware of movies coming out and... Like, remember going to see films and having opinions about films and remember getting excited about trailers. And it's very much something I associate with imagination and, like, simple, effective storytelling and quality. And I also think about my brother with it because it's something that throughout our childhoods was something we both liked. And so it was a very big thing for us was when we were both excited about the same film coming out. And so now do you still feel that way, even though you kind of like fell off a little bit after Finding Dory? I mean, it's one of those things. I haven't seen any of these newer films. I'm bad at seeing films in general. So that Mark has... Mark is going to fight you for one specific film. I'm bad at seeing films <laughs> is the thing. I don't, like, that's not against Pixar as much as it is against, like, I stopped going to see films regularly as I got older and busier and then proceeded to go to college. But the new stuff seems to be good for the most part. It is just a different energy than the stuff that I grew up with and mm -hmm. less 
instantly appealing to me. Mm. And so I'm not, I'm never going to doubt people who say, oh, this one's really good or this one's really great. But it's just like. You should doubt anyone who says that to you about Lightyear, though. (laughs) (laughs) You're the only person who talks to me about Lightyear. It's bad! (laughs) None of us like it here! (laughs) Wow. So have you seen slash do you know that Turning Red exists? Oh, I'm aware of all of the ones that have come out since. And I've heard great things about some of them. I just, I was telling Mark about this while we were uh, setting up. The more people tell me a film is good the more my anxious avoidant tendencies come out and I go, "Mm," but if I don't like it, people would be mad at me. So I'm just not going to watch it. Yeah. On that note, Mark, when are you watching the Dungeons and Dragons movie? You gotta go. I'm never going to watch that. Oh, let's pressure him. No, (laughs) I'm sure that it's fine. But I think like, if you miss that window of it being like a fun movie that comes out and you're not like, trying to spend money on a movie right when that moon comes out i'm like ah, i don't know if i'll get around to it i'm just not like i don't know I'm i not was just, like i want to be very clear i was making a joke about like not wanting to pressure someone if everyone's saying a movie's great when like everyone's saying that movie's great and we were i was like so mark when are you gonna see this movie everyone's saying it's great that's the anatomy of a joke <laughs> thank you but it is a good movie is... and i would encourage you without pressure to see it at mm. a time in which you are uh, you feeling You have to see it or else it's not going to get a sequel. You have to see it, okay? We're not going to get a franchise isn't it, out of it. Isn't it a sequel? And I already haven't seen the first one, no. so it's doing no. fine. It's a reboot. The last Dungeons and Dragons movies came out 23 years ago. <laughs> what? Wasn't there one that just came out? Or am I thinking of Warhammer? Not Warhammer. I'm thinking of, thinking of Warcraft. 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 Yeah. Yeah, Warcraft it's... was like 20... 15, that was uh, 2016. That was 2016. It was 2016. Okay. Was the year I, I, movie I know it was concurrent with season 10 of the sci fi series Face Off because they did a oh, Warcraft yeah. themed episode. I remember that being really big and I never watched it. I've got you. My my thing about turning red existing or not existing to you, Tessa, wasn't like <laughs> that you're not, not hip to the times or whatever. It's just that like some people we've had on truly did not know that it existed. And we're really? doing a, like informal survey about what streaming has done to Pixar's rep. It's time for Elemental to back. sweep. Is it going to sweep? We'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm getting more and more optimistic as the days go on, but I... I don't think it's going to sweep. I do think we'll do better than Lightyear. Yes, Which... the trailer looks much better than Lightyear's did. And it doesn't have the baggage, you know, that Lightyear has of it being like, that's not, that's not what I want out of a Buzz movie. It does look like yeah. what people would want out of an average. Also, the fact is the only other big animated movie this summer is Spider-Verse, which is obviously aiming way older. So it's like, it should, I think it will do okay. We'll see. When obviously. When is Ninja Turtles coming out? August. So okay. that to me is like... It, so it's basically the the summer. <laughs> Quick rant. I I love <laughs> ranting about movie schedules because I think these distributors are fucking idiots always. Because it's always like we're being comp- competitive, but it's like no. The goal right now is still to bring theaters back and bring this like money back. Ergo, being competitive is stupid. And here's my rant. Mark's heard some of it before, but I'm gonna really break it down the way I haven't before because we brought up this up. Is Puss in Boots came out of Christmas. We didn't get a single kids movie until Mar Hill a couple weeks ago. Now we don't get another kids movie until Memorial Day with Little Mermaid. Then after Little Mermaid, the week after Spider Verse, two weeks after that is Elemental, and two weeks after that is a DreamWorks animated movie. And then after that, there's not a kids movie for a month. <laughs> like what? <laughs> what is the schedule? Like why are these all so back together? And when there was nothing for so long. It certainly this seems counterproductive, but it also sort mm-hmm. of makes sense because if you want to market towards kids, marketing and releasing your film right around when kids are no longer in school does make sense. Okay, but then why is July empty? That's my whole thing is why is July empty of a kids movie? Yeah, that I cannot just Except for Barbie, but Barbie's not going to be, it's going to be PG-13, so yeah. Really? Barbie's yeah. going to be PG-13. They're comparing yeah. Barbie to The Matrix. Uh, I, I I would say things I know about Barbie, but they could be violating a friend's NDA if I say oh. them. 
<laughs> but I, it's definitely PG-13. I'll put it that way. <laughs> uh... They've seen it. <laughs> Random Mind has seen it. Uh, it's definitely PG-13. I feel like that's obvious from the trailer a... anyway, because the trailer has, like, the beat off joke. So. Yeah. I'm, okay, here's, we, we, maybe, I don't know, unless you guys have more thoughts, but, and then we can go to Pixar. My, like, stupid film audience member take is that Barbie should be PG, and I think that the beach off joke I mean, the, just, I like, I really destroyed my expectations for it, and I hope it does all right. But I'm like, come on! I don't really man. like the I don't really like the beach off joke either. But I do like I've said this to people before. The thing I like in the Barbie trailer. Have you seen the Barbie trailer, Tessa? Oh my my, I saw it like twice, and then my mom showed me one line of it, like seven or eight times in the course of like twenty four hours. Is it Ken going? Uh, like... Because we're boyfriend girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. My I'm my mom. For Ken. My mom kept mm-hmm. repeating that line over and over the last time I was at her house. Um, what I was going to say, the one thing I like about the beach off joke is the the reaction shot of Michael Sarah <laughs> that that made me laugh, but everything else on that I was like, eh. but cutting to Michael Sarah <laughs> just looking confused always will get me to giggle. The thing especially that beefed me on it was I beached <laughs> you on it. I be- beached you on it. <laughs> Sorry, go no, on. Just, none of that makes sense. It's just, okay, so I'm like getting over COVID, so I have time, and I'm trapped in my house, and I was watching 30 Rock compilations, and there's a line that they do where Jack Donaghy is talking about his like rival Jack, and he has that line where he says, it's going to be Battle of the Jacks, a jack-off, and then it ends... And it's not like the Barbie joke, which is like you say it enough times and then you get what they're saying, but it doesn't make any sense. Like, why would they say that in the first place? And I'm just, I'm so annoyed. Oh, I don't, I don't have an issue with that. Joke. I, I feel like, you know, like as adults, obviously, we're gonna be like, why are they making the beat off joke? But if we are looking at them as Barbie toys, having a beach off makes sense to me. It just it doesn't have the pun, hmm. obviously, to it. I trust oh, that's, Greta Gerwig. That's an intriguing point. I trust her. She makes good movies. I don't Hopefully, have an yeah. opinion, but it seems. Did you not see the New Little Women? I thought. I thought you. I, I just kind of assume everyone's seen the New Little Women. I. Okay, so this is a thing about me. I. I cannot explain this. I love so much classical, like girly classical literature. I hate little women because it was forced on me by my mother and so i have never seen any of the film versions even though i'm like in theory the person who would love it the most just because i just associate it with being forced to read a book i didn't want to read when i wanted to be reading different books because i was that kid yeah so right. no, I, I haven't like, seen Little Women. To make to make a succession reference, because I like making succession references on this podcast, it's your loony cake. And Mark will know what that means, and I don't need to explain it because it's accurate. Um <laughs> That's a, that's like a mid deep succession cut, I think. But I accept it. Oh Should we talk about <laughs> Can I say one oh, okay. can I say one succession oh, yes, related please, things? Please. I Oh I've I'm never gonna bring up succession later in this episode, just so you know. But go on, sorry. I have never seen the show. However, literally earlier this week, I found out that what's his face that all the Tumblr girlies love is Zach from Sky High, the one who oh. glows. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know what to do with this information. I think I might have shared a story on the podcast before, but I don't think you know it, so I can just share it again real quickly is my job has this really annoying thing when we show stuff for the kids my boss kind of unilaterally decides and it's usually like either the like the most kiddie movie they've already seen and they get annoyed that they're watching a movie they've already seen or it's something that she liked when she was a kid so she remembers it being appropriate when it's not when she freaked out at me once for wanting to show space gm2 because lebron says in the trailer matrix out to be clear to the listeners and to everyone here in this chat and this in this recording studio that we're definitely all in at the same time. Um, <laughs> uh, I was not excited for Space Jam 2, but I was excited to show the kids a movie that had just come out in theaters, like, at work, because it was on HBO Max at the time. Anyway, the one time I was able to bring up a movie and actually show it happened at Christmas this last year, and it was Sky High. 
So when he showed up in Sky High, I was like, oh yeah, there he is. The guy, <laughs> Greg from Succession, he's here. So, <laughs> but yeah, that's all. That's all. Because Sky High had not been in my mind for a while. And like a couple months ago, it finally popped back in. Oh, I'm always thinking about Sky High. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Should we talk about another kind of Sky High? Yeah, we'll Ooh. go up. Excellent All right. transition. <laughs> up! A groundbreaking up. movie! Oh, uh, great. <laughs> this is the, uh, I believe this is the first Pixar movie to debut at Con. More importantly... Which Con? What? The 62nd fil- Con. It's Film Festival. This oh. was at Cannes. Oh, oh, Con. C-A-N-N-E-S. Con okay. Oh, no, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not okay, like San great. Diego. <laughs> oh, okay. I get it now. I was like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah. Um, yeah, this premiered at Con. Topical because Elemental's going to premiere at Con. Um, but anyway, not really what's important about this movie. A uh, couple other big groundbreakers. This is the first Pixar movie they released in 3D. I'm going to talk about that at some point, even though I didn't ever see this movie in 3D. Probably the most actual groundbreaking thing of this is, you know... Wally, we talked about this with Wally, that Wally was such an influential movie that it combined with the Dark Knight getting pre- prevalent Oscar snubs led the Oscars to lead to its 10 lineup of Best Picture noms, which meant Up got to reap the awards of Wally snub and become the first Pixar movie nominated for Best Picture. Yeah, it was nominated for Best Picture, mm-hmm. of course, of our nominations. Famously, the score of this movie, we will probably, we usually <laughs> save the score to the end. We will probably talk about the score a lot beforehand with this one. Because it's the first yeah, Pixar movie to win an Oscar for the score. But also, it's kind of one of the more... I think it is, and the argument could be made, this is, like, the most iconic score of the 21st century so far, I feel like. The argument can be made. I'm not saying I agree with it. But I think it's between this and Lord of the Rings for, like, the most iconic score. Married Life is easily one of, the most, one of the most recognized themes of the 21st yes. century. Which is... Mm-hmm saying a lot for a movie that is an individual film if you get what i mean it's not like a franchise it's not like you know it's not like the avengers where we hear it every couple years um but anyway but yeah up made a shit ton of money as always with these pixar movies it'll take us a bit to get to one that doesn't make money um again this got a lot a lot of awards tension I feel like this is in a way probably I don't know if it's Pixar's most awarded movie, but it feels like it. I feel like this was this is the end of the trilogy of what we've been, the unofficial trilogy we've been referring to, where we had three incredibly original Pixar movies come out in a row, where it was like the argument at the time was like, oh, surely this will won't do well with the main audience. This is an old guy as the main character, and this is like the final one that before they go to sequel land. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah, this is so. This did is it up. go Ratatouille, Wally up? Yeah. Is what you're yeah. saying? Yeah, because okay. we, we've been kind of referring to it as this unofficial series in a way. Because mm-hmm. Jay, our guest for Ratatouille, Jay, kind of pinned it that way. It's like, you can see these next three kind of become more mainstream as they go on, but they all still fit in that mold of, like, this is a weird thing to pitch. Um, yeah. In a way that even I forget the whether it was him or you. Aren't. Yeah. I don't remember. That's, well, the, it, I mean, I'm just, I always think about something that someone said one time, and I wish I could remember who, but I'm just sharing it with tessa now because it's an interesting thing to think about and maybe people haven't listened to those episodes but it's like at some point pixar switched from being like the brand is pixar and you go to see the movie because of pixar no matter what and then it started focusing more on characters and that's why we have sequels so you go to see woody well, I, and buzz I, I, i've made that point see it because it's a pixar movie you made, I've made that point okay. i've made that point because very specifically i always argue about last year right where turning red got sent on streaming and Lightyear got in theaters when in fact and that's because bob chapik doesn't understand that the pixar brand is stronger than the individual franchises because people mm-hmm. would have probably preferred to go back to pixar with a big original movie that's good than a spinoff that looks unnecessary and gets middling reviews mm-hmm. um which is why so, another reason i'm like elemental sweep <laughs> hopefully hopefully it's good it's premiering at con hopefully but yeah up mm-hmm. tessa when was the first time you saw up so i didn't see up when it was in theaters that was uh that was a weird summer in our family and so i didn't get a chance to see it until the following easter I 
Oh, this is a good Easter movie, I feel like. It it definitely fit the aesthetic of Easter. Yeah. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it. Uh, unsurprisingly, I was young enough that I was... Oh, no, that's not true. I was starting to think critically about film a bit more. But I enjoyed it. But my mom hates sad movies. Like, pretty much all sad movies, regard it, regardless of what level of sad. And so mm-hmm. it was not one that we watched as a family very often because too sad. I love crying is a fact about me. Mm-hmm. I do it very easily. Uh, in Crying is good. Yeah. I, I was in an acting program in college and it was well understood that if you couldn't make me cry with your scene, you were doing a bad job and were probably going to fail because mm-hmm. I was that easy of a crier. And so I enjoyed Up and I have grown to enjoy more and more of it as I have gotten older while also being able to pick apart the elements that I enjoy less but still really appreciating the whole if that makes sense so how many times do you think you've seen it i'd probably wager about four five definitely Mm -hmm. not more than like six or seven it's not one it's not one that i've seen a lot um really any of the ones post really post incredibles pixar wise i haven't seen a lot but it has definitely made a very lasting impression now mark when did you first see up i'm going last because i've already shared my story on the podcast but i'll do it again but you so you i want you to go wait no i should go sorry i'm gonna cut you off (laughs) to hell with you yeah well no (laughs) because the people people who are listening regular listeners have heard the story before so i can go for it really quick so it just makes sense i don't i don't even have a story (laughs) mark let's end with your story because it'll be a uh, okay here's my thing i saw it when it came out i don't remember why it wasn't particularly like special i i just it was a thing i think it was just because it was out and it was whatever time it was and then i think the second time i've ever seen up was the watching it for this show so yeah that's my tale of up now oh, it's danny's uh, turn right. so to tell us about your before. grand tale of up. and this is a this actually relates back to the story we've already related to get on this episode which i was like this is pixar's brand blah blah blah. is i told you guys i think i brought this up in our wally episode um or maybe it was a, i don't know which episode i brought it up in but when up came out i went to an open house i ever i think right before or right after it where my dad got in a conversation and an open house is what we call in indiana graduation party because apparently that's not common nomenclature everywhere i always get surprised when i hear that but it is but whatever um but i went to someone's open house and you know in 2009 i was like when this came out i was 13 so it's not like i was that close to this guy in age especially when you're in high school now it's like oh five years different that's not that bad but in high school and like when you're 13 and someone's 18 that's a big difference but anyway uh we my dad got in a conversation with this guy about pixar's brand name and like how pixar's brand means they're bigger than doing sequels so toy story 3 and cars 2 are going to be interesting things because you know they didn't actually need to happen um but anyway it's a that's a perspective from 2009 that i keep regurgitating but i think we saw this opening weekend because i was the type of kid that was obsessed with pixar at this point I liked it, obviously. We probably saw it again with my aunts later in the summer because that's normally what happened with Pixar movies. But, you know, I have the DVD. It's, you know, I actually have the Blu-ray. I have the Blu-ray. This was definitely one. Whereas Wally, I said it was my first Blu-ray, but it was like a combo. This was more bought as a Blu-ray. Because with Wally, it was like, oh, we'll buy the Blu-ray because it's with the DVD. This was like something where we had a Blu-ray player already. So got up on Blu-ray. I think I watched it once or twice. And then I, you know, I don't know. Up isn't really when I revisited it much. I did revisit it, I think, in the build-up to Soul. I don't know if that was the actual build-up to Soul or if it was whenever I eventually saw Soul in April of 2021. But I did rewatch it in the build-up to Soul because I know I had it because I knew I hadn't watched it in forever. And this is Pete Doctor, who's the guy who did Soul and is one of Pixar's more autory guys. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's 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 good. I always talk about how it makes me cry. Actually, 
the most lasting legacy for up with me is that kids will ask me what's up and i'll go oh it's a really sad movie um because you know <laughs> usually people go like oh the sky or oh the ceiling i'll go like it's a it's a really sad movie uh <laughs> so are you just always joking on your kids yeah it's, it's, it's the life <laughs> that's a it's all I do is like when I, like we had three birthdays today, and my response to every one of them was like, "Oh dang, what? How old are you? 67? Or like somewhere like I was always like, "85? Is that how you're turning?" <laughs> you know, and like mm. no, because well, you know, the reason here's here's the actual motive behind that is one, it's fun to mess with the kid, but also I don't remember these kids' ages. I don't want to be like, "Oh, what are you like eight? They'll be like, "No, I'm turning 10. And I'll be like, "Oh, this is awkward then." But if you make a joke about it, you know, like. No, I'm ten. To be like, okay, you know, I obviously was joking, so I'm not caught in my lie. Then, like, <laughs> <laughs> what a clever ploy. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I really feel what you're saying there about. I don't know if I have like ever felt the need to revisit Up, but I feel like of all Pixar movies, I have seen the most clips of this movie. Yes. In other things. <laughs> And well, it's also maybe interesting to know that the opening 10 minutes of Up has its own Wikipedia That was page. what I was going to say. That got so, me mad on Wikipedia. That it has its own Wikipedia page. Why does it have its own page? Because that's kind of like how this movie functions. And I think how it functions for me anyway. It functions in like, film school as, hey, we can show you the opening five minutes so you, we can talk about storytelling in five minutes. Yeah. I think Up is a much more... Again, for me, and I don't want to... I feel like I'm going to be middle-of-the-road up person here. I'm not going to be super pro-up. I'm not going to be super anti-up. I think up is very interesting to talk about, and I don't super love watching it. I just, like, all the parts strung together don't do so much for me, but I think it's really neat to look at for, like, montages in the opening, and I think also its sense of scale is really exciting and i also think it makes some really big swings with like i don't know maybe it's kind of a cliche actually of is carl talking to the house as though it's ellie but i i have thoughts yeah. but i want we'll go for our general thoughts now uh my thing on up is up is the definition of like you know how people talk about like the mid-tier like i remember when luca came out people were calling pixar mid uh, like luca mid-tier and I was like, well, I give Luca, at the time when Luca first came out, I gave it a 4.5 out of 5. And I put it in my Pixar ranking, and it came right in at 13 out of 26. So it's like, I guess technically it's mid-tier, but like, that's a 9 out of 10 mid-tier. Um, up to me is the definition of, since it's a Pixar movie, it's very disappointing. If this was like a DreamWorks movie, it'd be like, you know, everyone would be like, oh yeah, top 5 DreamWorks, you know? Which I feel like is saying a lot about Up in a negative sense. But it's a four out of five to me. But as someone who comes on this podcast, like five out of five to Ratatouille, five out of five to Wally, five out of five to Incredibles, five out of five to Finding Nemo, the coming movie, it's like eh, four out of five. It's like it's it's good. I actually this might be uh, controversial. I don't cry anymore at the opening. <laughs> it just doesn't get me anymore. I cry at other parts in this movie, but the opening just it, it never gets me anymore. I'm like. Oh yeah, it's it's well constructed. I've probably been taught it too much in film school for it to be effective. That that might uh, do it. Yeah, but I think stuff later on in the movie, the ending of the movie always makes me like well up. Like the last minute of this movie is so the, to me the last minute of this movie is what kicks it up from the three point five to the four. I just think it's such a perfectly it's one of those things where it's like you know you talk about how Pixar like has these perfectly structured stories where you could tell they tested the shit out of them. It's like, how can we end this in the most effective way? And there's a, there's a there's a way to look at that cynically, but then there's a way to look at it, like, up, where it's like, oh, but, like, this is the perfect ending to the story. So, like, why would you not want to go with this perfect ending that's presented to you as a writer? Yeah. Could but, you yeah. remind the listeners what the ending of Up is? Yeah. So the ending of Up is the best scene of Up, which is the whole story of Up has been like solved basically and we're waiting at russell's um getting the badge pinned on him and obviously russell and i'll get into this a lot because i'm getting chills talking about it. now as an adult 
the stuff that hits me most of this movie is Russell talking about his dad and <gasps> Carl's reaction to that. That hits me more than literally anything of Ellie, honestly. Maybe when I'm older, the Ellie stuff will hit me again, but I'm much more interested in how a man who always wanted to have children interacts with a kid whose dad doesn't want him. Uh, that's like what this movie is actually about and is good about when it's choosing to be about that. I wish it was always about that, basically. But anyway, the ending of the movie is Russell is waiting to get, like, the badge pinned on him. And he's looking around for his dad. His dad isn't there. Carl walks up. Again, it's kind of like one of these things where it's, like, so constructive. Where it's like, why wouldn't Carl just be there? Because <laughs> it's clear Russell just came off the blimp, but I don't really care. And he's like, all right, Russell's going to give, you know, Carl's going to give him the badge. But he gives him the um, bottle cap that Ellie gave him at the very beginning of the movie. And it's like, this is the Ellie badge. It means you went above and beyond the call of duty and you're a real adventurer. And then they hug. And I'm just like, oh. And then he takes him out for ice cream at the place his dad used to always take him. And they play counting the cards. And then, of course, camera pans up to the sky, pans down. We see the house is still sitting on Paradise Falls as we fade out. Perfect ending. No notes. Obviously, like, the only way, like, once you do it, it's like, okay, yeah, this is the only way you could end this. Like, there's no way to end this movie better. Yes, that was one of the four different scenes in this film that made me cry when I watched it for this. Can I can I guess that one other one has a Wikipedia page for itself? Yes, of course. It, <laughs> look, here's the thing about the first ten minutes of Up. We could totally sit here and talk about everything that is wonderful and beautiful and special about those first ten minutes of Up. However... Everyone else has been saying it for like the past 14 years. So we don't need to be redundant. It's beautiful. We all know this. So yes, that, yeah. was, that was one of the four. It's one of those things where it's just like, to me, it's so, it's not only so, to me now, it doesn't affect me emotionally. So for me personally, it doesn't affect me. But moreover, it's just so like, there's a lot of very interesting stuff in this movie, good and bad, that to talk I mean, we'll, we, will, we will still... I'm not going to be like, all right, so moving on from the opening sequence, because I'm sure we will still talk a little bit about it. But I think there's a lot more here that people just look over. And I do think, in a way, the discourse around this movie did kind of become, like, in 2015 or 2016, be like, Up is a little overrated. You know, it's got those first 10 minutes, and the rest of the movie is kind of whatever. Kind of like the Wally thing we talked about, where, like, there's a lot of... There's a big contingency of people who are like, Wally sucks once they get off Earth. I think there's a decent contingency of people that's like, Up is okay once it's not about after those first 10 minutes, which obviously are the best 10 minutes Pixar's ever made, blah, 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 which I don't agree with either. I don't think those first 10 minutes are the best thing. I think I think there's a better argument for the beginning of Wally being the best thing ever made than the first 10 minutes of Up. Um, but anyway. Yeah. Mar and people may not remember, because I didn't, is that is not actually how Up begins. It, it does begins not. I, yeah, I actually and, always remember. I, you, I, that you, was, I messaged you. I, I was like, "What's going on?" How could you like, forget old timey <laughs> news announcer? Yeah, I was going to say, actually, is out there. I think that is one of the things I always reference in this movie the most, which is to do a little Zemeckis thing very quickly, and then come back to up in a way that is very relevant to what we're about to talk about. Is you know, I, I don't know, Tess, if you're aware of this, but I just watched every single... I think you are aware you, of this. I you, just watched you mentioned every this single, before D&D. Yeah, I just watched every single movie. Never done this before by a director, but the music box had a retrospect of it. And so I was like, I'll watch the ones that are not showing at home. I never done this before. I watched every single movie Robert Zemeckis had ever made over the span of, like, eight days. Which is crazy, because he's made, like, 22, 23 movies. Um, and one recurring bit he always goes back to... Which will be, it's something that's actually in this movie, where it's like, in, uh, I'm trying to be a very specific one, I think in like one of the Back to the Futures, he's like, I told her to get out of there, and it cuts them going, get out of there! And like, it, <laughs> this is the type of joke that will always make me laugh, I don't know why, it's just 100% my sense of humor, and to me, in this movie, when Muntz does that, I just always think it's the funniest shit ever, where like the newsreel announcers, Months, it's not exactly this, but it's like, months vowed to return, never to return till he found the bird. I vow never to return till I find the bird. It always makes me laugh. And that has been something that has stuck with me from this movie since 2009, that I will always reference this movie as where that joke comes from. Even though, as I just said, I just watched so many Zabakis movies where he, this is like one of his go-to jokes. 
Like, it's in the, I think, all three Back to the Futures at one point. Like, Doc will say something, and then it will cut to Doc saying it. Um, you know, but anyway, right. that's all. It's like, that That to me is like, Mark, you're like, you you don't remember this. I was like, I definitely do, because the newsreel joke is one of the main jokes in this movie I always think about, as I like that joke. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sorry, uh, Mark. Well, no, you're right. I feel like... Uh, this is this is one of the things where I think we'll disagree is about like the humor of Up. Oh, I don't I think we're gonna disagree. I don't think we're gonna disagree. But go on. <laughs> well, I don't want to go on about. I wanted to ask Tessa before we get too far into like the minutia of Up. Do you do you also have like a general impression of Up, or just coming back to it for this watch? Did you have any like overall thoughts? So. The, something that everybody should know about me is that two of the things and if you're going to make a narrative that is perfectly designed for me the two things that are most likely to get me intrigued are examinations of grief and found family and so in terms of like the thematic elements and then also the aesthetic elements of like the Victorian house and all of that sort of stuff up is kind of like designed to cater specifically to me and so there's a lot of it that really resonates with a lot of things that I had already liked as a kid it definitely formed some of those opinions and interests in those themes and so I would say that at least 65% of Up is one of my favorite movies of all time I do find some of the humor just, it gets goofy in ways that I find incongruous with the rest of the film and what they're trying to present, Um, especially with some of the dog stuff and some of the old man stuff. It's like, when it'll appear, it's just like, we're in the middle of something, though. And so... That's an issue with a. I don't want to be like because I think it's a big. I think it's a bigger problem here than with a lot of the other movies we've seen. But that is like a recurring issue with these animated movies. It's like you can tell they're a little worried that the audience is going to be. Where's the jokes? You know. Um, mm-hmm. because oh yeah. Because we talked about that at the end of Wally. At the end of Wally, it kind of becomes that at one point, and it's like, oh, you were doing so well, movie. Yeah. But I think this is this is a much bigger offender of that also. <laughs> oh yeah, and any animated film that tries to tackle anything serious, you'll see this to varying degrees. I mean, I always think about Hunchback of Notre Dame because it's probably the That's most so... egregious. But yeah, it whenever you're marketing something that is family oriented, there is that push and pull, but it's like I think the film in general has a sense of humor and it's more of a dry, witty, dialogue-based sense of humor. And then sometimes it'll go into this very goofy visual gag-based humor that's just like, this doesn't feel like what we were doing for most of the movie. But Mm -hmm. other than that, it's one of like, it's not one of my perfect films. I think like there are films that are perfect for everyone. But it's not one of those, but it is very, very high up for me. To defend a joke I feel like everyone else here is going to hate. I, I know think... which joke it is. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I don't. It? I don't know. Do actually, there the... are there are a few, so well, I don't actually know what you're talking it's, about. Go it's for the it. family guy cutaway to Russell falling off the house. Oh, uh, I actually think oh, that's, a, that's a good I joke. Think that's that's cute. I, I like that. But it's like the... Okay, good. Because that, that's like the... Because I feel like there's a lot of jokes like that in here where it's like, we're throwing in a joke, but that one always cracks me up because it's got the combination of, hey, I can see your house from here, and then dropping him. That's just this incredible like joke of how Russell, how Carl matches Russell to be an idiot. And then uh, the, 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 the drop, which is like... <laughs> and then what's also yeah. great about that is that later on in the um, movie, when Russell does start falling out of the house, we actually have, like, the visual... I mean, obviously, he's falling out of the house. We don't need to, like, be like, oh, he's falling out of the house, you know? But there's so much more depth to the shot where he is actually, like, dangling off the house in the climax, 
where it's like, oh shit, this yeah. is scary. Mm-hmm. We got to talk about the climax at some point, but we don't need to start at the end. Yeah. We don't need to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is like my least favorite kind of film criticism, but I am compelled. And I do, it does <laughs> seem like something like that is a much more thought out joke than a lot of the other jokes in the movie, which seem kind of like non-specific or underwritten or um, Can I... I do think some of the dog stuff is kind of funny but yeah. a lot of it is like america but south or like most of the things <laughs> okay. that doug says aren't but... as like they just they just don't uh... hit as much as the one he has the one line where it's like i would be happy if you stop and i feel like that's but i don't know just the way that like hits me it's very like they deliver the joke and then move on. And then a lot of the things that Doug says are just kind of like, eh, I think it's a uh, silly dog, but he's well, not like, you know, I think America, but South is weirdly like one of those very, you know, you come back to these older movies and you see these things have influenced you in ways you didn't expect. And whenever people ask me where I went to college, I go like, Oh, I went to Southern Illinois university. And then I pause for a second. And I go, it's in Southern Illinois. And I feel like that kind of comes from like that type of, um, you know, that type of, it's America, but South type of thing. But one thing that... Actually, all... I think your joke is better than America, but South. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I also want to say something that this bothers me, this bothered me whenever I rewatched the last time, and it stuck out to me again here, is the one thing I hate the most about the dogs. Because there's a lot of stuff not to like about the dogs, in my opinion. But it's when the dogs laugh, and they don't know how to animate these dogs laughing at all and it drives me crazy it's like they shake i'm like that's not what dogs do like just have them wag their tail and like be alert like you're trying to animate them like they're a crowd laughing and that's you're breaking the reality of this moment to me and i know it's it's a cartoon but it's like the whole the points when the dogs work is when the dogs are actually acting like dogs and their voice is the only thing that's betraying that they're cartoon characters Mm-hmm. So, Danny, how do you feel about the literal dog fight then? I don't want to talk about the climax <laughs> yet. It's not. I have issues. I think the entire. There's one. I just had to say the joke. I just had to make the pun. Yeah. I mean, it is a dog mm-hmm. fight. Um, I do actually like the end of the dog fight does make me laugh, but I just hate that the entire dog fight is there. But like the squirrel payoff, I do think is the one time the squirrel joke really works. The squirrel. Okay. <laughs> I think. When you watch the movies of 2008, 2000, like this era of my life, the trailer bits always stick out. Because nowadays kids are going to watch these movies, they're just going to think they're funny. But like, whenever Up does the squirrel thing, it's like, oh yeah, it's the bit that was in the trailer, you know? <laughs> like, Yeah, and that's the perfect example of like, when you're watching the film in context, it's like, what do you mean there's a squirrel in the jungle? That's, it's the kind of thing that just bugs me. And I mean, I don't know. Especially when, like, I think he first says it when they're, like, in that very sparse era. He's not even, like, if there's, like, a flying squirrel in the jungle, sure, I'll buy it. You know, like, you don't need to explain the joke for me, but it's, like, they're or, literally or in the middle of nowhere where there's it, nothing. Sorry, like, Tesla. Tesla's giving me that like look where it's, like, these guys are cinema sinning this. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel it. <laughs> I don't think it's cinema sins to be, like, you, the, like, the joke should be, like, rooted in the reality of the scene or the world I think the or squirrel whatever. joke is good. I just don't think it's in a good spot. You know? Mm, yeah, I mean, I don't... Maybe we're saying the same thing. Because I, I don't know. Tessa, I, you I, know I, usually I listen squirrels? back to these things and I'm like, I didn't analyze that in a way that made sense at all. I do think it is a good joke when... What kind of what kind of do we think of it? this is a bad joke? This is a good joke. I like the joke when <laughs> we the first time we're introduced to Alpha, we hear the high pitched voice and we know what's going on, but like they don't explain it. That's I mean that's something that just I like in any situation is when a joke is not explained and it's just like you can just get there, you know. I think that is a good moment. Yeah, I, I love I, I, Alpha. I think Alpha's for... Oh, okay, go on. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, won't, I won't be too negative on him. <laughs> no, I think Alpha is very funny. I think I think his scenes are weakened because Beta and Gamma are so generic. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, but Beta is voiced by the legendary Delroy Lindo, which I didn't realize till I was like, till the Del- the Five Bloods came out in twenty twenty. I was like, what have I seen Delroy Lindo? And I was like, he was an up, and I always have to look up. I, and now I remember he's in this movie, but I always have to look up who he's playing. You know? Yeah. Um, it it's just those characters. This is such a nitpick, but this is one of the I. For the, for the viewers at home and for Danny who did not hear this, I have three pages of notes in my other tab. And so <laughs> one of the things I specifically wrote about was just that, like, when they come up, they just don't particularly have personality and it weakens. Like, they don't have to have a lot of personality because they are bit characters. However, I think Alpha is such a strong and funny concept and then is under supported by giving mm-hmm. very generic henchmen who aren't even very henchmeny. I think if they were more hen- like a stereotypical henchman, it would be funnier. But yeah. Yeah. I I think Alpha in and of himself is a very funny character, just not well supported by the world around him. Yeah, it's almost like they're really not there to be henchmen. It's more like, you know, you need that second person there so that they can talk and give you exposition. Yeah. Rather than, like, you know, be characters or whatever. As soon as we get on the ship, I feel like those two especially just kind of disappear. I mean, I think in general, okay, the dogs exist to be something we can cut to for a joke. (laughs) That is why the dogs are here at all, I feel like. Because I really don't think once Munts is introduced, they really even act like dogs anymore. You know, they fly planes while chewing toys on the dogs. You know, it's like, it's, it becomes, I don't want to be like, it's too cartoony. Because I do think that criticism is a little lazy. Like, obviously, it's a, it's a cartoon. We can be wacky. But I think everything else up until Doug is introduced exists in, like, this magical realism but then the dogs show up and it's like, oh, it's the stuffed animal we can sell, you know? Even Kevin, even though Kevin is also a stuffed animal you can buy, she's more, she she still fits in the world that we've been up to at that point. But then Doug shows up and starts cracking jokes. I also think it's a fair distinction to make between animated film versus cartoon because those are two different art forms and one isn't better yes. than the other, but saying that something is too cartoony when you otherwise have been doing a not particularly cartoony animated film versus something that is more cartoony where you can get away with that because even if you are an animated film and even if you are a cartoon there is a certain internal logic that comes with its own expectations and acknowledging I don't I think it's a fair thing to say that certain parts of it are working under different rules and a different internal logic than the world we were initially presented with. If that makes sense. No, it does. Yeah, it does. yeah, definitely. I, I do want to eventually get back to Doug himself. Cause I feel like we're talking more about the dogs in general, but I think to really, I mean, I mean, I know we already started talking about up, but to really start talking about up, you got to start. You think I'm going to say the opening sequence? Nope. We have to talk about Carl. And I think, Carl is, in a way, one of the most fascinating characters Pixar's ever made. And I know that's, a little, like, I'm like, this movie's just okay, you know, four to five, you know, just okay on the Pixar scale. But, like, Carl is so fascinating to me as a protagonist. Because I remember when this came out, they, uh, Pete Doctor said in some interview, like, this is a coming of old age story. But I don't really think it's that either because a coming of old age story to me would imply it's a story about a man learning to retire or a man learning to like accept this place in the world. i think this is it, this is a movie about you said it already and i think it's probably obvious. this is a movie about grief um this is a movie about a man who is not only grieving his lo- wife and but i met, i think it's he's grieving the fact he never got to be a dad too. oh absolutely because and the world that he yeah, because people always, you know, people, you know, there's this discourse that always pops up, I feel like, every six months. But I saw it recently where people are like, 
getting mad at people who are like, I'm so glad I don't have children. It's like, well, have fun in your old age when no one's taking care of you. And that's this, this is that's this whole cultural thing that I don't really even want to touch. But I think it's an informative way to look at this because I do think Carl is probably the type of person who before he couldn't have kids probably had that attitude of like, well, good luck having someone take care of you. And now he's old, his wife is gone, and, and there is no one for him. And he is mad that his life has gone by and not only does he not have Ellie anymore, he was never able to give Ellie the closure that he wanted to give her. So he's not only grieving Ellie, but it's like Russell comes around long. He's like, he's forgotten that he even wanted a kid. I, I said that earlier. To me, the most emotional aspect of this movie is the Russell and Carl relationship when it actually slows down and let Russell actually be the character he is rather than the comic relief he is for a lot of it. Because I think he is very compelling. And I think, obviously, I think Carl. Carl is such... A fascinating character and how he one thing I love about the climax the thing I would say I love most about the climax is I think the movie does this really brilliant thing with Carl's design where over the course of the film when he's in Paradise Fall you can tell he's getting a bit of a sunburn and his stubble starting to grow out that by the end he looks so much younger because of that <laughs> and not only how he's also animated to move younger too but he just looks more like an adventurer he looks kind of like I was thinking because, you know, there's a trailer for New Indiana Jones out right now. Like, he does give that, like, older Harrison Ford vibe at the end, which he doesn't when they first get to Paradise Falls. And I think that's a conscious part of, like, both the design of how he progresses throughout the movie, but also after he has his epiphany that he's able to move that way and become the hero that he's always wanted to be, even though he's not even thinking about being a hero anymore. He's thinking about, you know, he's just become... He's become the father he always wanted to be that he forgot he wanted to be. I, Which I think is all, even though I'm saying it out loud and I'm sure it's something Pete Doctor discussed, I think that is still all in the subtext of this film. It's not like, it's like, thanks for the adventure. Go have a kid. You know, <laughs> that's, not, that's not what Ellie wrote in there. But it is in the text there, I feel like. Absolutely, yeah. And I think one of the interesting things about Carl and his grief and I think it's so true of when we're grieving a loved one is that he becomes obsessed with the idea of preserving the memory of Ellie and what Ellie would want him to do that in the process he forsakes the thing forsakes is such a dramatic word but he ignores the things that Ellie would have probably actually wanted him to be focusing on because yeah. they wanted to have kids they couldn't have kids this kid just falls into his life and he is so dismissive of russell and one thing i noticed on this watch around and the wires had never corrected and like the wires had just never crossed in my head ellie loved birds like there's pictures of her in the book with birds she worked with the birds at the zoo and so protecting Kevin would have presumably been something she would have been invested in. And I think there's a lot about how we focus on and glorify the past in his arc, especially with how he gets foiled by months. Uh, foil is in narrative foil, not foil yeah. as in uh, bested. And... Mm. This is a totally different point, but it's one that I wanted to say is I think there's definitely something interesting with the Danny, you mentioned the guilt that he's feeling and with the time period that they're from and that they grew up in. I think it's very interesting that they're, oh gosh, this is such a random thing to bring up, that they're a dual income household. And I wonder how that it probably doesn't, I don't think anyone ever thought about this, or maybe they did, they're smart, but the idea of that additional guilt of not even being able to be that breadwinner, and even with her also working, not being able to ever have the money to get there. And I I just love okay, stories okay. about grief. It took, mm -hmm. it took me a while to get there, because I thought you were, sorry, I, I was <laughs> like, well, they're a dual income household, but they're both probably like, Maybe Ellie's getting paid more because she seems to be like working there as a, not only as a tour guide but as like maybe like a researcher too at that zoo. But Carl's it seems just like selling they, they like hired Carl as a favor to Ellie. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, but I do... I think that I made the connection last time I watched it, which is still valid. Um, I didn't make the bird connection. That's actually something I never thought about this movie, which is crazy. But I always look at how Ellie and Carl treat the kids they interact with throughout that entire sequence, the opening sequence, because I think it's very informative then, of course, on how you see if he treats Russell because, you know, and it also is very informative. Like, of course, of course they'd be good parents if they could, because you see them interact with kids at their job on the regular to like the end of that montage. Like you wouldn't be a balloon salesman for your entire life if you didn't like kids. But that's, that's all very compelling. Tessa, the way you broke that down. And I, th- it's helpful to me because I have watched this, I think, both times and been kind of confused about why Carl goes from being this guy that seems pretty okay with things and to, turns into this very grumpy old man. But I mean, it's all there. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, I guess it's like it's an interesting movie where I think it could it functions by leaving a lot of things out. And I think some of the things that, it's a movie that plays with you know what it what questions it puts in your mind and then what questions it smartly avoids i think it is successful sometimes and less successful other times but anyway that's just it, it's well, interesting that you mentioned there's all that there yeah i think carl is very the thing about carl is like he is very complicated and is what you just said where a lot of stuff is on he's a quiet character he's leads a lot like he will lash out but like it's interesting. I don't. I really don't know how to put this, but I just find it fascinating in a lot of ways that he is. This is the type of movie where I, I okay. When this movie came out, you know, the, the, we we talked about this before with Brad Tweedy. Why it's like a rat can cook. How is that going to sell the kids? Uh, robot doesn't talk. How's that going to sell the kids? And here it's like an old man is your protagonist. How's that going to sell the kids? I think it's interesting to look at that and then see that this movie opens with him basically like assaulting someone and like giving him head trauma and like getting arrested for it and everything that happens in that sequence is like yeah like this all plays out the way it probably should but of course that opening sequence pulls so much weight in giving us sympathy to him but also it's like he is the type of guy that like you know when he hits that guy everyone on the street stops and stares at him is like oh my god what's this old man doing and i don't know like I think it's a very empathetic look at old people, for one thing. But I also just think it's... I don't know. I, I don't really know what, what point I'm trying to make here. Yeah, but it's... I think... Yeah. It's a very interesting... Say? Like, and... He is so literally holding on to the past. And, like, that's very much his arc. And that's why Muntz is the villain. And we see it play out so many times. One of... A scene that particularly struck me this time around that I was aware of, but I didn't think about it as much on past viewings, was when they hit the cumulonimbus, and he just stops steering entirely. Preservation of the house, his life, this child's life, all of it is nothing in comparison to the preservation of the stuff that he and Ellie had together. And I think so much about this is about him moving forward and being able to let go of the past. I mean, there's literally a scene where he has to fly the house and empty the furniture out of the house. I was literally about to say, this movie to me is probably i think up to this point has the best epiphany scene of any pixar movie because i think every pixar movie has it maybe maybe nemo nemo would be up there too probably but the epiphany scene in this movie where carl because i always talked about that is like even when in 2009 i remember in 2009 when i saw this movie and i cried at it i've always been very open about crying pixar movies so i was not embarrassed to say i cried it up um, like, because, you know, sometimes 13 year old boys are like, I didn't cry. <laughs> but I was like, no, no, of course I cried. Like, it's sad. Um, I was like, yeah, I cried at the beginning, but like the part that's actually really emotional in this movie is when he flips through that scrapbook. Oh yeah. At the end. We've, and, we've hit three of the four, what? Three of yeah, the four crying scenes. Yeah. But then of course, as you just said, 
the literalization of him letting go of Ellie and throwing out his stuff. The thing that got me the most emotional in this watch, besides the like final scene that I already said made me cry, like oh, it didn't get me crying, but it did like get me like that really like, oh I want to cry right now, um, is the pan over to their chairs after he's <laughs> thrown everything out of their house. Uh, it's like yeah, like this is where Ellie and Carl end. And it's okay to end. And of course, he'll still have the memories of it. But this is where Carl and Ellie should end at this side of Parasite Falls. He's finished it. Like, they are sitting here now. Like, the chairs are sitting here now. And that is where they will be. And I think mm. about that as beautiful. Like, and then, of course, at the end, you get the punctuation of the house is there too now. Um, but, yeah. It's really... It's one of those things where it's like... Kind of what I was saying about the ending too. It's like... It might be, a cynical person might be like, it's too obvious, but it's like, yeah, but like, if it, it doesn't matter if it's too obvious, if it's the best way to do it. <laughs> like, you know, like, there's no better way to end this part of the story. I think it's Which is important. why it gets a little annoying when it, it cuts to Russell right after that scene going like, I'm gonna go find Kevin! I'm like, god damn it, we're back in the, we're back in the <laughs> plot of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is worth noting for all of the people who will be listening to this who do not have the visual, literally just Danny describing that scene has me getting worked up. I'm like, I'm blinking back some tears because it's just, it just, it's so good. It so, just hits everything exactly how you want it to, or at least how I want it to. It resonates well, really well. A, I really don't think there's a way to do it better. Like, no. for what this movie is aiming to do, like, we complain about anything, like, we can complain about the bird and, like, the dogs, but, like, I think at its core, the Carl and Ellie stuff, like, the re- like, I say, like, I like the Russell stuff more, but I think the Russell stuff I like because it flares up, it's clearly not the main focus here, and I always am surprised by it when I revisit it, even though I go, like, I think I like the, like, I remember, like, Maybe when they were like, uh, when Kevin showed up, I was like, I think I really like the Russell stuff in this movie, but I always forget about it. And then sure enough, when like they're talking about, I'm sure this is the last thing you cried at, yeah. was when they're talking about like, yeah, my uh, Phyllis isn't my mom. Like, I'm sure that was oh. like, uh And then the, but like that then, scene always hits me. And then he, Russell making him cross his heart. Uh, and the yeah. facial reaction that they well, animated is, um. As, as someone who works with kids, the th- and this was also what I was go- kind of building to at one point when we were talking about the opening sequence is I think what is really interesting about this movie is about I'm trying to think of this way to word this it's like kids are pretty constant I've worked with kids since 2015 like they're gonna always be like talking about new stuff like because there's always new like oh yeah we're playing Minecraft now or we're playing Roblox now but like there is just this weird universality of some things kids do. And I think I always like in media where things kind of become circular and like we go back to the beginning, but like him going cross my heart the same way Ellie does at the beginning is like, yeah, of course Ellie acted like that. She was a little girl. And of course Russell's acting like that. I don't know. I don't really, it's something I don't think a lot of movies tackle or even media tackles where it's like, He's remembering, like, this is a movie that's, like, again, I'm going back to that thing where I remember P. Doctor once referred to it as a coming of old age movie. I don't, I don't think it is that. It's a, it's a movie about a man remembering who he once was at all ages of his life. And how he can use that and become the good parts of himself again. And Mm -hmm. a part of that is how Russell reminds him of, like, one, the kid he always wanted but never had, but also just how he and Ellie were as kids. Because he is kind of a combination of the two of them. Yes. He really is the way he acts. Because you can tell he's nervous about things, but he's also like very much like, no, I'm an adventurer. I might not be capable of this, but I'm still going to try to save these people. And he were like, see, now I'm getting much better. Because I never really, like, he is kind of like, he's the son Russell, he's the son Carl never had in how he is written too. And I think that is very smart and in a way that, like, I can only come to this now. I, this is such a thing about this movie. It's such a smart movie on paper, but then in action, it's like, ah, oh, but the dogs are here. Ah, oh, this is going <laughs> on. And it's so, in a way, it's very frustrating because, like, there's all the, like, there's all the pieces here for this to be, like, one of Pixar's best work. And I know there are people out there who's like, yes, this is Pixar's best work or, like, top three Pixar. But I don't think any of us are there. Maybe you are, Tessa, because you're like 65% your favorite movie all the time. But 
I think me and Mark definitely are like it's not, but like the pieces are here, and mm-hmm. when it hits these pieces, well, this movie is on fire. It's just that again, like I, I mentioned it earlier, like you'll have this beautiful epiphany scene, and we'll cut to Russell going like, "I'm gonna go save the bird," like with a leaf blower making him fly, and it'll be like, "Come on, like." We couldn't find another way to like transition back to this without it like feeling so abrupt. But mm-hmm. you know, even though you say that it's like not a coming of age, coming of old age movie, and it's more about grief, I think it's kind of written like a coming of old age movie because it does. Maybe this is what you're talking about, or what is it? what? I, while you were saying that, I was thinking about how the movie deals with grief, and it's kind of like Carl. You could say that Carl abandons his grief. And he's able to give love to Russell in a way that he's no longer able to give it to Ellie. And I think that's kind of the arc of the film is him learning how to give his love to Russell. And I think it's strange to think of it like that because I think a lot of people would say now that like grief is an ongoing process. At least that's what I've heard like real people say about grief versus what it is in the film. And I think the film is fine. I like it's of course very effective to have him tied to the house and then abandon the house and then it's like he's no longer like weighed down by memories and grief. But well, I but I don't think that's how most people that I know now would talk about grief. But just an argument that in Pete Doctor's eyes and also in the eyes of the film, it is like a coming of old age movie. Because it is about this, like, development of the man. Oh, my rejection of the term is just that, to me, coming of old age implies, this is a man learning what it's like to be retired. I just don't like the turn of phrase. That's that's literally where I'm getting at with it. It's like, I don't... Because I said earlier, I think Carl comes off way younger and more full of life at the end. And I think, obviously, that's the point. And I'm sure Pete Doctor agrees with me there. I'm just knocking his, you know, turn Mm -hmm. of phrase. Yeah. You got hung up on the old age, and I got hung up on the coming. Yeah. Tessa, do you have anything about the of? I no. <laughs> I mean, I actually had... This is going to be a poll. Um, talking about the grief weighing, literally weighing him down, and the stuff literally weighing him down, and comparing it to a coming of age, weirdly brought, of all things, Labyrinth to mind. Oh, I haven't seen Labyrinth in years. Oh, I don't like, think I have seen Labyrinth. Oh. Whoa, you stumped us. Go ahead. Spoil Labyrinth for us. It's fine. Like, well, I'm, I'm aware of what it is. Yeah. Go ahead. Go. So there's this scene where Sarah, teenager, developing, this is all the coming of age story, ends up in like this dump, basically. And this character is trying to weigh her down with all of these things it's like oh you need this you can't let go of this and it's like her teddy bears and all of her childhood things and her being forced to reject the parts of herself that are inhibiting her from growing further as a person and i don't know the the parallel just struck me in that moment five minutes from now i'm going to labyrinth was Labyrinth presented as good to, like, throw away your childish things? I'm curious now. Labyrinth is... Labyrinth pushes a lot of things at the same time. It is a very strange and sometimes confusing film. What that scene, I think, is more representing isn't you have to throw away everything. It's more of a you can't use those things as a distraction, which is what is trying to what the character is trying to do. And it's like, you can't just seek refuge in the past. If your present is not what you want it to be, you have to do something. Admittedly, right. it has also been a couple of years since Labyrinth. I've seen Labyrinth. It's very cool. They're showing it at the music box later this month, but there's going to be a shadow cast. And I don't really like revisiting a movie with a shadow cast. You know what I mean? Like, I want to see the movie for the first time since I was like five. I don't want to see actors acting in front of it. You know, I just want to watch the damn movie. Yeah. Um, it's, it's definitely worth watching. It's, very cool to to get back to the point um even though i like labyrinth that, don't get me wrong, that was a good good thing to bring up even if neither of us have seen it like it actually that's especially why it's a good reason to bring it up because you know neither of us will ever bring up labyrinth on this podcast on our own um, <laughs> but i think what we just talked about with carl and russell and ellie that brings me back to doug because i actually do think this is where doug does play a pivotal role in the movie 
Because whereas Russell is a rejected person who is the actual like metaphorical son of Carl, Doug is someone who gives Carl unconditional love immediately because he's been rejected by everyone. And this is where my succession reference is going to come in that I really wanted to make because it's the one note I made when I was watching this. And I was like, this is a funny observation to me and me alone probably. But Doug is the Connor Roy of Pixar. He is a love sponge and he just wants to give love and hope to get it back. But if he doesn't, he's like, oh, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And a that's mood. the one succession reference I wanted to make this episode. Just so Mark can put a picture of Alan Ruck on the um, that was a picture. <laughs> oh, thank God. You know, I do have a thing. I try to reach like 10 to 11 layers in the in the image editor. So mm-hmm. always good to have a, have a, a name but pop up while I'm listening. The, I'm like, oh, Alan Ruck. To, but to cut back from Connor Roy to just a general discussion of Doug, I do think Doug, the one part of this movie he really works for me is when he is like, I hid under your porch because I love you, which is great callback also but then he's the first person who gets to fully see the changed carl after his epiphany and both carl's reaction and doug's reaction to that is so it gets me that that gets me too is just because i i've complained about the dogs a lot but i do genuinely like doug when he's not like making i love how doug is animated doug acts just like an actual dog like how he is a like I might complain with the Everdogs, but Doug is consistently like spew, like he really is one of those like animated dogs that a hundred percent reminds me of an actual dog, and I like I want to hug Doug. He is like, and I don't. I'm the type. I know there are people out there that's like whenever they see a movie with like an animal, they're like oh, I want to hug him. Doug is like one of the most like I really want just a plucked toy of Doug. Like I said, he's there to sell toys, but he does a good job selling them. He is so cute and adorable, and he acts just like a dog and seeing Carl be the type of person who I don't know. Do you guys want a very dark dramatic backstory of Danny about his yeah. dog? We so, so rarely get those on like feature film guest episodes. So, I had a dog growing up. Her name was Lucy. I was kind of a dick kid, like most kids are. I was the type of person who'd be like, "You suck. You suck." To my dog, or like kick it around, but then one day I think maybe like, wait, you're two... saying that you did that? Yeah, I was mean to my dog <gasps> for a bit. I'm about to get to the point where I stopped being mean, and it was like two or three years in. It wasn't that bad. I mean, I didn't kick her all the time. I want to be clear. I played with her outside stuff, but it'd be like you like the dog more than me type of person, you know, like that type of like that type of meltdown as a kid, or like be like get away from me, like you know. Our, we had a really nice dog. She she took all this in stride. Oh. Uh, Lucy was a really good dog, actually. Um. But then one day, I think it was because we got her in, when I was in second grade. So I think this would probably be when I was in fourth grade. So it was like, a, my brother's two years younger than me. So it was like a picture book still. So I feel like second grade's kind of the year your parents stopped reading picture books to you. So I think my brother was in second grade when my mom read this book. And I was just hearing because I was in fourth grade. But she read this book to us where it was called Toby. And we, she checked it out. just Well, I think I had actually checked it out because it was like, you know, a cute dog on the cover. And it was a story about this dog who gets older and th- as she gets older, the main kid in the family, the older sister in the family, starts getting meaner to it because the sister's getting older too. And she's like, I don't want to take care of this dog. Like, I have to take care of her more now that she's getting older. And eventually, like, the dog is like, we have to put her down tomorrow. And it's like, the kid comes down and sees her crying over her do- dog <sighs> that night. And, like, that, that book fucked me up. <laughs> but also... It- it gave me a very valuable lesson of caring about my dog. Um, but I don't know. I just remember, like, coming home in, like, high school or middle school, like, breaking down crying with, like, because my parents would, like, my brother would have after school activities. My brother would go home with his friends. My bro- I didn't have friends in the neighborhood. My younger brother did. Um, so I'd just come home and, like, basically <laughs> crying to my dog. And my dog didn't care. And I just remember when we put our dog, my dog down, it was, oh, I was, we put her down in February of 2014. So it was my senior year and there was a lot of sh- bad shit going on in my life. Someday I'll go into all that here. Maybe, today isn't the day. But I just remember like, you know, I, I, I was the person with her when we put her down. Because my, you know, brother, my brother was in college, my older brother was in college and my younger brother just I don't know what he was doing. I think he just didn't want to be there. But 
I don't know. I guess this isn't that deep. It's like, I had a dog that died. But, you know, it's just something where it's like, I'm a dog person, 100%. Even if, I'm allergic to cats, so I have to be a dog person. But also, I just like, I don't know. I think how I treated Lucy and, like, how, you know, I I don't know. I miss her. <laughs> you know, it's, it's been it's been nine years and I still miss her. So, um, and it just really... Doug always reminds me of her. See, I'm getting a misty right now. Right now, I don't know why. Oh, I'm maybe already crying. Un- I'm fully uh, crying. Maybe I have this on. Un- maybe it's something where she like completed me in a way that you know a way you know dogs complete you in a way that pets in general complete you in a way that I don't want to talk about this anymore. I'm sorry. I don't yeah. know why I'm actually. Well, I appreciate I've never actually it, cried on I... this podcast, but now I am. <laughs> it's like, whoa! Well, I've always been like on the verge. Is... This has been like subtext for your life since I think I've known you. So I appreciate you sharing that. I think that's yeah meaningful to a lot of people. Yeah. So I just remember yeah. also we um I remember me and my mom well one, we saw two twenty fourteen, you know, we, we I'm a person who's always liked animation, so we always went to see the new animated movie. Two days after my dog died, we saw the Lego movie, which both one fucking rules. I love the Lego movie, but yeah. also really bad moment in that movie where she goes oh my real name's lucy and you could just feel my entire family wince but then the other thing with that was like a month after that we saw mr p me and my mom went to see mr peabody and sherman and we just started bawling our eyes out at the end of that mediocre movie because there's like a big speech the kid goes gives her it's like there's nothing like having a dog that has your back and we're just like oh oh no (laughs) we miss ours it was like that movie like completely i've not seen that movie since then. i'm sure it's mediocre I've, but i remember being like this is a good movie i don't care <laughs> like, I, I remember seeing mr peabody and Sherman. i was it it is not the you know it's nothing particularly extraordinary but i do remember it being quite good so yeah and i think the thing about to get back to up i think the thing about doug to me that always makes him work is that he's that as someone with the experience of having that moment in my life where I had a dog and treated him like treated her like shit, it's like he very much represents like how the Lucy would still come back to me looking for love, and eventually I was finally able to give that to her, um, and like really work with her through like at the end of her life, and it's like that's you know what Doug like in a way you know when eventually we're gonna talk about Doug again. They have all those Doug shirts on Disney Plus. We're gonna and we're gonna talk about Doug next week too. But, like, I think Doug works in a way the other dogs don't. Yes. Particularly because, one, he's not really involved in that dumb hierarchy that, like, the months like, military complex <laughs> that we get in this movie is. But also he is, like, Russell, someone who's been rejected that Carl must learn that is now part of his found family, as you said. Um, I think Carl, uh, Car- uh, sorry, Doug works to me so much more than Kevin ever does in this. Kevin is a MacGuffin, yeah. which is fine. You can have a MacGuffin, but like the idea of me having a emotional connection to Kevin being reunited to her kids is just something I'm like, eh. you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> well, it's inter- Kevin is actually kind of tragic to me because I never find Kevin funny. So all that's left <laughs> for me to feel about Kevin is like sympathy for her, and it's like. It's it's I've, just interesting here you say that because I'm like oh man Kevin is such a sad character and there's nothing else really there I will going say on for me about Kevin is I don't have this thought anymore but I do have a memory of having I'm like dang you were a bit of a sociopath at 13 because I always I have this memory of seeing up whenever I saw it the first time and having the thought of like them like trying to take Kevin I'm like why don't you just give Kevin's babies to them too so they can be together in captivity and I'm now I'm like dang like savage Danny like the, that's where his mind went at age 13 was like just kidnap them all like then they can be together oh my god <laughs> but yeah I don't think Kevin's that funny <laughs> how far- can I ask you, and then we don't have to talk about this anymore, how far between, like, Up and the Lego movie was it for you? I mean, my dog died in 2014. This came out in 2009. And I've actually already told the story on this podcast when we got our dog, because we got our dog two days before Finding Nemo came out. So I very much associate seeing Finding Nemo with us getting the dog and deciding what to rename her. Because I pushed for Dory, and I'm glad we didn't go with that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was not a creative kid. <laughs> 
That's funny because I definitely named my brother after Thomas the Tank Engine, and everyone went with it. <laughs> oh, which is a real tale. Wait, is your brother was your brother named Tom? Thomas, yeah. How? Why does this clip for me? With our like, you know, how we always talk about how you look like Tom from Succession, and what you have a brother. We talk about that all the time. How you look like Matthew McFadden? Because no one calls him Tom. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, and no one yeah. calls Tom on Succession Thomas. Let's so be weird. I mean, yeah, but. if it makes you feel better, my cats were named, well, I still have Maggie, obviously. Uh, my cats were named after Maggie Smith and the Virgin Mary. <laughs> I, <laughs> those those well, are good names. <laughs> well, she was named say... Mary. She was not named the Virgin Mary. That would <laughs> the have virgin. been. You that... just named uh, the Virgin. <laughs> I'm not going to say where it comes from now, but hopefully well i don't know i'll still say it is i have a very in mind what i want to name my daughter if i ever have a daughter and if anyone ever interrogates me about where it came from i am going to lie because i think it is a good name without that baggage so <laughs> oh mm. yeah well are we gonna know i mean it'll be something like I, 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 I will not first, say. I, thought of like, I will not like say Alita on this recording. I will no, no, no. It's a name that's a normal name. But if you find out where I heard it from, it'd be like absolutely not. We cannot name. It's like I remember there being this Reddit thread where it was like, "Is my wife mad that I want to name our kid after this character from it?" And it was like Zoe from Firefly. But no, no, sorry. Is it wrong that I hid from my wife? Like, am I the asshole for not telling my wife that these names came from a TV show? And it's like Zoe from Firefly. It's like, well, Zoe's a name on its own. I don't know if you're entirely an asshole to say that's where it came from. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I didn't answer it. I don't ever answer this. I just like reading them. But like, this is that type of name. Where it's like, it's a normal name. But like, if you found out it was from some, what it's from, you'd be like, uh, what? <laughs> but Wow. My, yeah. my brain is just going wild. But yeah. hmm. hopefully whoever I eventually... Is the mother of my children does not listen to this episode. Man, we need we need to thing. like get you a daughter so I can <laughs> get a clue to this mystery. When you say get you a daughter, I feel like that's the type of thing where you adopt a kid and you can't change their name. When you say get, we gotta get a daughter for you. <laughs> well, no, I mean like if I don't know, you could get I mean, a daughter also, you know, and then you, be like, we, oh man, I, I say I, can't I say all this, but it's like you know the whole whole thing where it's like you have a dream name for your kid. It's not like you have full say on what you name your kid anyway, so it's it's not really even relevant, you know. Well, it, you could choose a real banger like Thomas, and everyone just names him after a train. I mean, it but, could have been worse. No, my um, at my least name it wasn't Percy or Gordon. Going to be a, well, I was gonna say, uh, I could oh, name, it could have been. I could name my but, kid. Uh, I could name my kid Carl Frederick. Uh, <laughs> Carl I'm pretty sure that's just I, like a Swedish is... king. <laughs> pretty sure it's Carl Fredrickson. So... <laughs> Would you name your boy like, like Kendall Logan or something? Connor Kendall. <laughs> Isn't Roman's full name like Roman Romulus or something like that? I think is... Romulus is like a nickname. Oh, you mean Roman's a nickname for Romulus? Or is it different? No, I think I Romulus is his nickname. Oh. Well. You know, I gotta say, this is something I thought about with Succession and talking to a kid today. I'm not gonna obviously mention the kid. <laughs> um, but in Succession, Logan, Connor gave, sorry, I know you don't watch Succession, but Kendall is a second born son and his full name is Kendall Logan Roy, which means Connor, we don't know his middle name, but Logan decided to hold off on, like, naming his son after him until the second son. And I think that's interesting, but also very true, because my younger brother is named Timothy James, and my dad is James. And there was a kid at work today I was talking to where she's the second daughter, and she has her mom's name as her middle name. Okay. So like, well, that's why this all. Yeah. I was wondering why you were talking with this with the kid about this. You're just like unloading no, Twitter no, it was, drama. It was, it, was this kid's, like... it was this kid's birthday, and I thought I was like, that feels weird. I'm on first glance but now i'm thinking about my brother and that makes sense i know with my D, &D right. characters four kids that we did that <laughs> that's not helpful information <laughs> <laughs> no that's we, good i actually I think, think... It's some, I think it might be something where it's so like in succession it's weird because he's the second four but like i think at some point you just start running out of name ideas so that's why that happens you know <laughs> like, like all right i guess
guess now I'll finally name him after myself. That but, is, that's pretty compelling. You you use your one good name on the firstborn. <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, oh, well. I, mean, I also kind of figure maybe Connor's mom picked Connor's name because, you know, Connor's kind of the black sheep of that family. See, now we're actually talking about Connor Royce, and that's the reason for you to put him on the picture. <laughs> he'll, he'll get in there somehow. Um, uh, Tessa, yes. do, what, I want to know more about things that you came in with. Because you, I think you have some thoughts that me and Danny would never bring up, but I want to know what those are. Okay. <laughs> There's still a lot of this movie we haven't touched. Okay. But on, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me skim my three oh, yeah, pages notes. of notes. My note, my note is just Doug equals Connor Roy. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I talked. I talked about Munz as a personification of holding onto the past to the point of glorification, which is making him a foil. We haven't really talked about months, though, if we want to talk about once. I'm, but we can keep going for your notes first. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm I'm just making sure that... If there's something that inspires you or something that you're like, ah, yeah, this thing, then that's what I'm curious about. Oh, this is a very tiny detail, but I just wanted to mention that the credits song, the Spirit of Adventure song, is so cute and, like, old-timey radio. Like, it's just a very cute detail that they just it's like only put in the credits and so i'm very glad that my brother trained me to never ever ever leave before the credits he was doing it before marvel it's the sequel to to infinity and beyond the song that we forgot to talk about our buzz lightyear episode but i brought up at some point later on that we forgot to talk about (laughs) is that the buzz lightyear of star command the adventure begins starring tim allen has a william shatner song at the end credits where he just goes to infinity and beyond Let's all sing a song. <laughs> but Spirit of Adventure is kind of like that. And this is where I can say, this is why uh, Tessa's actually on, is because she and Mark were in the first reading for Maria Kent in the Spirit of Adventure, <laughs> which is accidentally named after this movie, I guess. <laughs> None of wow. us thought about it at the time, but I guess it's accidentally named after this movie. <laughs> it really is, wow. <laughs> I do like that they have the song at the end. Just, I don't know, just because, like, no, I, I don't think a lot of people are on the page that Up is on, that it's really, like, always calling back to the 20s and newsreels or whatever, but it starts that way and it ends that way. It's like, this is a movie that is inspired by, it's inspired by adventure, and I don't, it's, it's about grief and... I guess if we wanted to like dig into it, then letting Russell into his life is like Carl's adventure. How do we, how do we think that like squares with the movie? I mean, because it is the like about want, adventure. The adventure they always wanted to have was having kids, and Russell, it's Carl's kid. Like you know what I mean? Like the, I don't. Wanna, they, that's maybe that's probably a big simplification of it. But like to me, that and also there's a the literalization of like he wanted an adventure, right? But then at home, the actual his adventure book's filled with, you know, like, he's hanging out with Russell and Doug. Um, although, I will say, I've watched all the Doug shorts on Disney+, Plus, and we're still waiting on Carl's date, and we have not met Doug's mate yet. So maybe that's what Carl's date is about, is Doug, him setting Doug up with a date. That they're just being a secret. You know what I mean? That's possible. Maybe. Because we, we see all those puppies of Doug in the credits. We do see that. And to talk about the spirit of adventure and what the adventure is, it definitely is about having the family he always wanted to have. But I think it's also just doing any, like, not doing anything, but just being able to move on and experience life in a way that he hasn't before. And the new adventure... I don't know where I'm going with this, to be perfectly honest. But just the Hmm. idea of what he's able to find when he opens his heart to someone else or to a couple other people. And he finds this world that is the same as the world he had with Ellie, but also entirely different. And is able to find beauty in a world that has changed so much since when he was a kid and when he was exploring the world to its well, fullest. I think, sorry, no. Mark, were you going to say something? Well, I just, I just asked because I also did not really know where it was going. I've just enjoyed listening to you guys 
pieced together so many parts of the movie that before now I thought were really disconnected and now I'm seeing how it's all coming well, together. So I was like, I, I didn't have a notion there. I was just like, oh, let's, I bet this means something too. I don't know what. What do y'all think? What I think but, yeah. I want to bring up, because I do think it relates to what we're talking about, but I also think I said I want to talk about him is Muntz. Because yes, he's a foil to Carl, but I think the interesting thing about Muntz is Muntz is the... First off, I think Muntz probably actually doesn't work to me. He's one of the things that maybe that does not fully work to me. But he is one of those things that on paper should work, but we don't really emphasize the stuff about him that... The stuff stuff that's good about him is stuff you have to think about, basically. It's not spelled out to you in the text, which could be considered good. To me, it's not good because this is an animated movie that is being marketed to the families, and if they wanted this stuff to work, they probably should have explained it out. But Muntz is the guy who Carl always wanted to be. But when he finally meets him, I'll put it this way. The end of the movie, the, the epiphany scene, Carl leaps through the book and he sees that Ellie's had an adventure with him, living her life with him. If you looked at Muntz's book, it'd be empty. It'd be him with dogs, doing nothing for 80 years. And that is the actual... And I think maybe you've, you've been hinting at that with you saying he's the foil to him. Um, that is the, the actual like tragedy of Muntz in a way, that he's gone insane by doing nothing with his life. And he, he wants his life to amount to something in the same way Carl wanted his life to amount to something and go to Paradise Falls. The difference is between them is that Carl had Ellie... And Munch just has his dogs that love him, but he does not love them. He views them as tools. And, you know, I think all this is there. I just don't think the movie emphasizes it enough. It's just, oh, he met the crazy old man in the jungle. Um, and the movie never also acknowledges really how old Munch must be, too. He's just a slightly older version of Carl. <laughs> but I guess, you know, part of that can also be like, oh, he's he's living in the, the great clear era of paradise falls so maybe that's why he didn't age as much but like i don't know i think there's all that stuff that is there for months and i think it does relate back to like what is the adventure carl's finding he's like well he's finding out that an adventure that he like always wanted to have like he always wanted to be months months had a really lame life really like just a bunch of aimless searching for something and getting more and more mad about it that's well, and yet the years. dialogue contradicts that because he says that he has pieces being stored in museums and he kept his favorites for himself. So it seems like he's had some kind of outside contact, even though I've... he obviously hasn't. Oh, those I've are from that. those are from his original adventures that yeah. made him That's famous. How I was with it. He oh, he had yeah, okay. this big grand life, but then when the controversy surrounding the bird skeleton happened and he got stripped of all of his accolades and considered a disgrace, he was unable to move on because he only was working on this external validation and he had nothing. He was empty inside without it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was reminded of, I don't know what moment of this movie did it, but I'm sure it was something of months is I was rewatching, you know, for the Zemeckis thing, I rewatched all the back to the futures and, you know, I always thought about Back to the Future 2 as, like, I got really, I was like, it's like, it's like Frozen 2, right? Where I get mad at Frozen 2, where the only thing I could think of for, um, what's his fuck? Uh, Kristoff. <laughs> he's not a what's his name, he's a what's his fuck. Um, Kristoff is, like, he, six years working on that movie, the only thing you can come up with for a flaw from him is he doesn't know how to propose to Anna, really. And I used to always think about that with Back to the Future, where it's like, really, the only thing you can think of is, like, he doesn't like being called chicken. That's the only flaw you could think of for Marty. But then, you know, I rewatched the third one where he goes like, wait a second. Biff is an asshole. I don't give a shit about what he thinks. And I don't know. Th there was some moment in this movie that triggered that for me. Me thinking about that line. And it, I'm sure it was something between Muntz and Carl. Where Carl is like, ah, oh, yeah. The, you know, it's, I don't, I don't know why I'm bringing this up. But other than Zemeckis, I'm, I'm a Zemeckis head at the moment. But... I don't know. I think that's a, I don't know. Back to Future Finger 3. I think that's actually a good lesson to have in a movie. It's like, don't give a shit about what assholes think about you. And I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know what triggered in this movie me thinking about that. I wish I could remember. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd taken that note instead of writing dog equals Connor Roy <laughs> multiple times on an open sheet of paper. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's better than the, one of the notes I wrote, which is I wrote 
down notable creatives as a section in my notes. And <laughs> I just wrote Christopher Plummer, voice of Charles Muntz, bullet point, Captain <laughs> Von Trapp, several heart emojis. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, uh, he's, he's famous for... Um... Actually, I was having this conversation with someone um, to mention someone we've talked about this podcast before but who we really don't want to talk about. But we were talking in my group chat about um, Jonathan Majors very briefly about how Creed 3 has to be like the best timed movie ever because it came out like three weeks before all that shit hit the fan. So it's like the movie did well and then it like, you know, it did well enough that like, okay, now it can fall apart, you know? Comes out a month later, that movie is dead on arrival or at least severely hurt on arrival, right? Um... So it's like, what are movies that came out at really well-timed things? And I was like, you know, in a way, I think all the money in the world came out at the perfect time. Because if that movie did not have the whole Christopher Plummer replaces Kevin Spacey thing, that was the entire marketing for that movie. It was like, holy shit, Christopher Plummer replaced this big role in like 10 days. And that's why that movie was a moderate success. That's why people went to see that movie. If Kevin Spacey wasn't in that movie initially, no one would have cared about that movie. <laughs> And that's what I was thinking about with Christopher Plummer here. It's because I think of late form Christopher Plummer with, you know, people. I haven't seen. I'm sure you haven't seen Beginners. Mark, maybe have you seen Beginners? Beginners is what I he won his Oscar Beginners. for. I think he won the it same year as like came an out. Oscar movie to me. I don't know. Maybe Beginners is great. Yeah, it's what he won his Oscar, and like it kicks that, and this kicks off like the late form Plummer of like that, all the money in the world, and of course his last big role of Knives Out, which I think he's. I think he's very underrated in the first Knives Out. I think he's very much the glue of that movie in a way people don't talk about in his very brief role. he's He plays a very tough part very well. Oh, yeah. Harlan um, Drombey gives a lot of credibility to that film. Yeah. And I actually think people talk about how Glass Onion misses, like, a main character that's as good as Anna de Armas is. But I think it, the issue is more... It, even though I actually like Glass Onion more than Knives Out... I do think it's missing someone like Harlan Thrombry to like make the m- emotional stakes of the story really hit as much as it could. But anyway, um, that's. But I do think if we're talking about the actors here. Um, Ed Asner. <laughs> we, when we talk about voice performances that oh. should like win awards, Ed Asner in this so good, such a perfect. Perf- like I've said this before about like. Ellen, right? Or like, if I see Ellen, you know, you just hear Dory, right? Ed Astor's the type of person where I can watch like old Mary Tyler Moore show episodes and be like, oh, it's Carl, you know? Like, I just like it's he's Carl first to me, and I think that is true for people who were aware of him before this. Honestly, I don't think people went to this movie going like, oh, Ed Asner, oh yeah, that's Ed Asner doing it. He just becomes Carl so perfectly. Did he always sound it, like that? I, I've i only seen of Ed Asner this and Elf. So I genuinely... Does, did his voice well, always sound like Well, he sounds like this like and that? Elf. Yeah, he all... Well, in Mary Tyler Moore show, he plays like the old boss who's grumpy. But that came out like in the 60s or 70s, I think. I can't remember when Mary Tyler Moore came out. He was born in 1929. 1970, 77. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, we're both right. (laughs) Whatever. So when that show premiered, he was 41 years old, but he's just always looked old. You know, he's like one of those character actors who has always kind of played old. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is, in a way, why, (laughs) I guess, maybe the logic behind, like, oh, we could have him face off against Christopher Plummer as an older man. (laughs) Because Ed Asner's always been old. So, of course, there's old, actual older people than Carl. (laughs) Which I guess is also kind of true with Carl's. I think Carl, when you first see him, like, in his 20s, he does kind of have the design where he's like, okay... He's just, like, kind of always an old man, you know? And that's fine. Like, there are people like that in the world. Oh, yeah. there's No, <laughs> fuck you. You look old. <laughs> no, 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 it's... No, it's... <laughs> the amount of times I've been cast 35 or older, sometimes <laughs> when there were actual people 35 or older. We maybe need to start wrapping up. But I do think there are a couple other things I want to talk about. Very briefly. And maybe you guys have other stuff you want to talk about, too. One of them is, I think it's really interesting to talk about this movie where it's like, you know, the big premise of it is like, and at the time, you know, the trailers were all of a sudden like, this house flies with balloons. And now, to me, whenever I watch it, I'm like, oh yeah, I guess it does. You know, <laughs> like, it's just such a, oh, of course it does. Like, and maybe that's just because this has become such a part of the culture where it's like, 
yeah, that's what up is. That you're not surprised by it anymore. But I guess, like, at the time, you know, there was all this thing where it's like, Mythbusters is like, can a house of wounds actually float a house? And it's like, well, it's a cartoon, so I don't give a shit. Well, did they find out, or someone, this was like on the Wikipedia page, I think, is like, they figured it would take like 23 million. So they're always using, you know, some number in like the 10,000s in the shots or something. I, I do remember like that original trailer with the flying house in the city, though, and like the wonder and intrigue of that original trailer. And why is this old man flying this house? How many balloons are there? How did he get all of these balloons? I feel like it is perhaps one of the most quintessential Pixar concepts and images in the sense of like, it's such a simple premise rooted in such familiar things that is then just taken to its most extreme degree to create something beautiful and wonderful and extraordinary. And I think that when I think about Pixar, it is very much that taking something so rooted in reality and making it the most fantastic thing in the world is very much what they do. I, I, I do think that like the awe, even though I'm not like, you know, I'm saying I'm like, I'm used to it now, but I think the awe is still somewhat there in the sense that the movie up until Kevin shows up does kind of exist with a complete, like, cause the tone is still there once Kevin and the dog shows up, dog show up. But the initial like magical, like tone of like, what is going on here? Like this is, it still does have like, it's not, it's like the disbelief is built into the magic of the story. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like, definitely. I don't know. Maybe that doesn't make sense. Okay. That's good. C- cool. But yeah. then once, you know, the bird shows up, it's like, oh, okay, this has to be, like, a plot now. There has to be a plot now. Which is a little disappointing because it's kind of better when it's just a man's trying to fly his house to South America. Are y'all um, familiar with Tuesday, the book? The picture book Tuesday? No, I'm familiar with Toby. That's the book that made me cry about my dog. You know, it's that book with the frogs that fly around at night and they just start flying one Tuesday night and they go places. I was thinking about that book a lot while watching this movie because I think that that is kind of a man. Yeah, maybe it's maybe this is totally suggest- subjective. I think it's a more successful example of like s- surreal imagery and that magical realism kind of thing. And of course, it can be more elliptical because it's a picture book, but. Yeah, you're right. The movie does run into these issues of like, well, we kind of have to have a plot now. My big beef with Up, maybe we've said it already, is just the script of Up. And this is what we are saying is like when you get it, you know, when you have to sit down and stretch it out and then tie 90 minutes of things together, it just doesn't happen. And that's, it's just baffling to me. I think there's an interesting lesson I don't know if you guys disagree with this, but Tessa, you mentioned earlier, or you were talking about the when he throws the items out of his house. Oh no, what you were saying earlier was about when he's driving into the cumulonimbus and then he stops driving and he's protecting the stuff. I am so frustrated because doesn't he leave the mailbox behind? He does have to leave Did the I mailbox behind. That? He does leave okay. the mailbox behind, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Now they throw all that they throw all those cans in his front yard and I'm just like we got to like focus on the button, we got to focus on the mailbox, we got to focus on these things in his house that he just dusts and I think there's a screenwriting lesson there to be like if you know you're always testing a character's relationship to this big question about them and you have to put them in a situation where they have to answer the question one way or another. And so the question, of course, at first is like, how does Carl react to his mailbox getting fucked up? And it's that he fights, he beats the guy up. So later on, of course, you answer the, you ask the question, how does he relate to the objects in his house? But it's not the same question because he may, he might not feel the same way about the bought objects in his house that he does to the constructed mailbox. And 
this might be a small quibble, but I think that this is kind of an issue with the movie overall, is that it it just doesn't tie things together. And Danny even related to what you said, too, about, like, Carl is obviously related to months and he's a foil like you said tessa but the movie doesn't ask these questions in a way that shows you that these things are related explicitly like you can just see it all there but the movie doesn't create situations where characters can make that Mm. clear i so my beef with up see i like that it isn't all laid out for you like there is theoretically a better version of this film that does away with some of the goofier aspects of the comedy and instead focuses on these things. However, I for one don't mind having to sit and think about it, which isn't to say that the I don't agree with you, but I don't find it to be a fault to have to sit and think about some of these things. And maybe that's because I overthink everything naturally, but I don't inherently think that having all of this be subtextual is inherently less worthwhile than if it was pure text. I also kind of push back by like, as much as I'm like, this this doesn't connect, blah, blah, blah. It's like, I don't know if you can make a better version of this, even though I'd like to think you can. Maybe it, to me the better version of this is basically the same plot, but like the jokes aren't as bad. Because the thing to me is is like yes, this movie is maybe you cut some stuff, but the stuff that's here is so good in the sense that like yes, like Doug relates to Carl and Ellie, and so does Russell. But how does like we talk about uh, like I, of course Carl and Munts relate to each other, but how does Munts relate to Russell? Right? Like these things aren't connected into a cohesive whole. It's like. Carl's at the center. It's like one of those webs you make as a kid where it's like <laughs> theme, po- you know, like, you don't know talk about like the word bubble web where it's like Carl's at the center of this, but it's not like Russell connects to months and they all connect to each other. Right. They all exist mm-hmm. on their own plane, but they all connect to Carl, obviously, because Carl's our main character. But like, I even, well, I don't know to me, even Kevin doesn't like Kevin connects to Russell and to months, but to me, he doesn't really connect to Carl. Other than, as you said, with Ellie and her love of birds, but that's never explicitly stated. So it's like, you know, all this connects, Kevin connects to all these that connect to Carl, but does Carl connect to that? No. You know, like, that's my whole thing is like, but I think to make Carl's story powerful, you wouldn't want to connect like Russell to Mutz. Like, there's no reason to connect the two of them, really. So it's like, how do you make this a cohesive narrative when there's all these different things that still do connect to your protagonist for the most part, but don't really relate to each other well i think that there is something to be said for not exp- not like making some things explicit i think i mean especially with just with my example i think that that creates different relations between characters and different objects so you see that i mean i'm just talking about like things in his house as an example i think that there are different relationships that Carl has between different objects in his house that the script shows us like during the film because he he does feel like different amounts of of care to different things in his house or maybe I mean maybe I'm like projecting because I'm like you have a house full of shit Carl you have like not all of it can be like the most significant thing in the world to you Carl is a maximalist king but I guess I'm just saying, like, I'm not. I'm definitely not saying, like, I'm not saying, like, the film should lay everything out. But I do think that part of the film, another example is, like, the inconsistency in the character of the dogs. Just, if I had to diagnose what I thought was my, my main issue with the film is that, is that it is just, like, inconsistent about certain things yeah, that's yeah. certainly fair um, we definitely like i mean we kind of gloss over not liking the climax but it's just like it becomes this big dumb action climax where the dogs are flying plants and it's yeah like, and, the, and like how can from? you like take any of that and use it to analyze themes you kind of have to just be like 
And there's also this dog climax, but we're going to uh, talk about Russell other parts of the movie. completes his arc and is able to climb up the hose. That Why? is true. But <laughs> can I say, I hate the old man fight. That It's really rough. It's, it's, it mm-hmm. is inconsistent with everything else that is going on in the universe and is just a bunch of cheap shots at the obvious jokes. And I think you could get away with one. I think the denture moment you could definitely get away with. But just like everything being like, ah, my bad. It's just, it's the lowest hanging fruit. And I feel like if you wanted to make comedy in this scene, you could have done something better. That was truly the only moment in the movie that made me like groan was that scene. But on the other end of... I agree. But on the <laughs> other end of the climax, I do think... Uh, we didn't mention this before. This is the... Um, besides, this is after The Incredibles, the first Pixar movie you rated PG. And I'm pretty sure it's almost entirely for the scene in the climax where Muntz goes after them with a gun. And it's like, it gets very dangerous. It's... I think it, that is like one of the, like, the most tense sequence of this movie. And it's yes. good because it's the climax. It should be tense. Because it feels very like real in how like this guy is coming after them and i think it's very smartly done and put together it's the best action part of that climax to me another thing Um, i was interested in hearing y'all's opinions on is the actual art like art style of the film because i personally think it's probably one of my favorite in terms of pixar in regards to balancing like the gorgeous realism with stylization and i'm curious to hear what you guys think having seen a lot of these movies much more recently than i have mm-hmm. i think yeah I, yeah well i think all in particular fantastic characters i actually want to mention this <laughs> just because i saw the movie in the last year but i saw on wikipedia and i i saw this when i okay i saw guess who's coming to dinner when sydney poyer died last year um, I think he died last year. That sounds about right. Um, but and he's designed after Spencer, Spencer Tracy's appearance in that movie. And the thing I remembered was seeing Gus who's coming to Denver being like, huh, he looks so much like Carl. And I looked at him afterwards like, yeah, he was, his design <laughs> in this movie is literally, like his look in this movie is an influence on Carl's design. Like, of course. <laughs> but even knowing that he very much looks like a caricature of that character. He doesn't look like, and so in that regard, I think, Carl is a really greatly designed character. The other humans in this kind of just feel like Pixar humans to me, with maybe the exception of like the foreman and the other, like, you know, the, the, uh, you know what I'm saying? The four, the, like the guy who looks like he's from Men in Black. Yes. The guy. <laughs> just like, he's the only one that looks very stylized to me along with Carl human wise. But also, as I said though, like, I love Doug's design. I think Doug's design is perfect. I think he's one of the best designed cartoon dogs ever. Um, I think, in general, though, I think the talk about the design and up and keeping it the character design would be silly because I also think, of course, the house is such a iconic look in how it is very compact but also very beautiful and wonderfully painted. And, you know, I also was thinking um, this... Actually, Mark, you answer, you answer her first because I'm going to pivot in a different direction that I don't... I want you to answer about the style first before I pivot in a different direction, but it's something I want to say about the house. But. Oh, well, I mean, I do love it. I love, th- I think that you've hit on something that's very special about the film, Tessa, is that it brings all these things together and just in the same way that it is a film about the spirit of adventure and newsreels, it's also about uh, gentrification. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was seems... like, bring up. <laughs> yeah, like... it's, it's kind of about, it's, a, it's, it's and it's about it's these a... things without bringing them all exactly under a unified Pixar style and I mean obviously one obviously this was a this is all unified and it's a Pixar movie but it's not like in Wally well in Finding Nemo is maybe a better example because everything in Finding Nemo kind of looks the same um even like the realistic parts of Nemo everything kind of looks like these characters all live in the same world but up is not like that up has like really realistic cities and um like the cliff uh but then you also have like the newsreel aesthetic 
and then you have the house which is kind of its own thing and i think especially there's that great shot of the house in front of the very real looking cumulonimbus cloud that i think is oh i remember there's a shot i think it is that shot you're talking about but i remember one of the promo images for this movie like before even a trailer was out was just carl like looking out at the cloud and it's like it's only in the movie for a split second but when it hits it's like i remember well and i remember the promo image but two it's like it's it, you wish it wasn't in a second it's a very striking image of just carl's back like completely like i don't know what the word for it he's like lit in a weird way because the cloud is the cloud's darkness is so overwhelming and it's such a cool mm-hmm. like it's literally in the movie for maybe like half a second and it's, it, like, it's like oh i wish we'd like lingered on that more of him staring at the cloud there that's there, really like a wow shot yeah there's another one that i absolutely adored that just like hit me like a ton of bricks this time around was after the after the fight when Muntz tried to set the house on fire and uh, Russell is refusing to help anymore, that Carl has the house attached to himself and it's backlit so we can just see the silhouette of him and the oh, house yeah, and the cliffs and it's shot. like that orange and purple light around them and it was just like, oh my god, this is just gorgeous. Mm-hmm. I wanted to say about the gentrification bit that Mark tried to pivot to, because this is what I was going to pivot to, is I think, and I mentioned this earlier, I do think one thing about the beginning of this movie that feels very striking today, maybe it was this in 2009 for people who were woke and weren't children. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, people who weren't children at the time. But, like, how this story plays out of him refusing to move out, and I think about, I just saw this movie called A Thousand and One, which I wasn't too big on. But, you know, it's a story you hear all the time about these people who, like, you know, they get new landlords, and their landlords fuck with their houses to try to get them to move out or, like, up their rent. And it's, like, this is that here in 2009. where And I don't think... I think it's just, you know, like, it's... And now it's, like, a social injustice. I think in 2009, it's sadly just a part of life. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, yeah, well, of course this is going to how we're going to open it. It's not necessarily, like, a big societal tragedy that this happens. I feel like that's kind of, like, the attitude of this movie um, but also that's not, like, I'm not like calling P doctor out here. I just think it's like, you know, in 2009, this wasn't what people were thinking about. Um, mm-hmm. but I do think it's interesting that it's there. That's all. It's like, I think this is a part of the movie that very, even to th- like when I saw it in 2020, um, it didn't really hit me as much as it did now of like this story arc of Carl, you know, trying to leave, not, not wanting to leave and like being tried to push out by these bigger companies. Um, I also want to say my other last thought I had that I wanted to be like before we really start wrapping it up with our final questions was um, because we mentioned it earlier and I really wanted to talk about it is we were talking about how Ellie, you know, how Carl talks to Ellie as if she's there. There's one moment in this movie that has always bothered me and it's when Russell starts pretending he hears Ellie and Carl just goes along with it. Because that, to me, is not how that is presented the rest of the movie. I don't think Carl is actually hearing Ellie in his head. And I think the idea that he, Russell, can play him like that. And Carl goes along with it about getting, like... Because if I... To me, the actual reaction there is Carl being like, no, knock that off. Like, immediately, like don't even humor that. But the fact that he plays along with it is incredibly weird to me. And that's always been my thought in that scene. Um, mm-hmm. maybe you guys are like more willing to buy that he's like actually hearing ellie but no i, I agree I, t- I clocked that i am going to play devil's advocate not because i think that he is hearing her voice <laughs> i'm gonna make that very clear it's not that i think that he's make he's hearing her but i think that is at least it can be argued that he knows what Ellie would actually say. And so is... Oh, so Russell's like bringing it to mind by him. Cause yeah, Russell's it's like he's talking to Ellie her. and it's just like he's hearing what he... Like he not literally hearing, but he's thinking like the response he would want her to have. And then Russell's like, she said I can keep it. And it's like, that is what... Fuck. That's, that is actually yeah. how she would respond. But I feel like... I, I get what you're saying, but then it comes back to the core issue we nailed with this movie, which is, like, there's all this stuff here that if we talk it out, yeah, I guess it's there. But in that moment, do I think that, personally? No, even though I've watched this movie four times, I never I never get to that conclusion. And I think if 
I can't get the if I if it takes you explaining to me a movie I've seen like six times just you know what I mean? I'm not I'm not oh, knocking yeah. you. I'm just saying like this is a problem with the movie that like if this scene is to work, which is this pivotal scene of Carl deciding to keep Kevin, it needs to be clear on why it works to everyone immediately. You know, it shouldn't have to be explained to me what fourteen years after I first saw the movie. That so. is certainly fair. <laughs> All right. So Well normally I'd say let's just jump right ahead to gift giving. Oh, we're I was kinda reaching that, the Sorry, but yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I know I do just, I, there is one question that is on my mind because we're watching the movie and maybe you have another one to think of, Danny, but I would really love to address the question that we like to ask is like, how does this movie, if we were to like, imagine we just saw this for the first time <laughs> now and like, how does this affect what we feel about the studio Pixar? Because I think this movie is so interesting to me because... If I saw this now, I think I'd, you know, I'd feel about it the way I feel about it, which is kind of lukewarm and like, what the hell? But also, this is like one of the most exciting Pixar movies I think we've seen. Like, if this was coming out now after everything we've seen, I'd be like, I didn't love this, but personally, but I'm so interested in what is coming next from this studio. See, I definitely disagree there because I think. By maybe maybe because I haven't rewatched Soul, maybe my Soul rewatch will make it like me like it less. But I think the Soul turning the Soul Luca turning red run. I think all three of those movies are so much better than this personally. So to me, if you were to come out of this, I'd be like, really? Um, I do think not. You don't you I, don't think it's so weird that you're intrigued? I think well, no. Here's I don't want to be like rejecting your question because I I but my thing with this movie is to me this is the movie where the Pixar for like we know I know I said this about cars but I think here more so because it's a successful deployment of it this is where the formula really makes itself clear to me because it has the epiphany scene it has the second act breakup it has and it doesn't have the stuff like Ratatouille where Ratatouille's talking about film criticism or like Wally which Wally's doing <laughs> totally weird shit constantly in that movie with having the characters remain robots the entire time um this is a movie that 100% follows that what we call the Pixar formula to a T. And it the seams start to show to me cuz to me the movie the movie becomes interesting when we talk about how things relate to each other but because of how the formula is set up we can't fully examine those relationships. And that's what I think about with Pixar to me is that even though yes this is a very well executed version of their formula it's still is so held back by that formula and that demand to fit into the four quadrant family movie thing, even more so than Wally was where I complained about Wally's in the, I think this movie is so much more hampered by like that. We have to fit in with our conventions here. Um, and to me, I think honestly the three, I, maybe not soul. Cause I, I really, I can't go to bat for soul that much. Cause I've only seen it once compared to Luca, which I've seen twice and turning road, which is way more recent in my mind. And I remember turning red definitely takes a lot of departures from the, the, the formula, but I think Luca and Turning Red to me are so much more exciting for like, okay, cool, where are we going next? Whereas Up would be to me like, okay, yeah, this is like something they could have made in like 2003 um, with Finding Nemo, and like Finding Nemo is great, but Finding Nemo came out six years before this, right? I would like to see studios move forward from things. Um, although th that whole thing comes to this whole thing where it's like, with Finding, I don't know. The whole thing I'm saying also right now, it's like, you can bring this, you can argue this back at me when I say Coco might be the best thing ever, when it is probably one of the most formulaic Pixar movies they've ever put out, but it's such a, it's the perfect execution of a formula where it's like, okay, like, you know, like how I said, like this movie has the perfect ending. It doesn't have the perfect everything. And that is where the formula holds it back. But mm. yeah. But Tessa, what about you? I, to me, this is just so quintessentially the Pixar of my childhood. And so if this were to come out now, I think it would just be like, I would just be excited to see them getting back to some of the conventions and sensibilities that while part of the formula also are so much of the soul of that era of Pixar that it would just be like, yes, whatever that 
thing was that was gone for a while is back. And maybe it is in some of the things that I haven't seen yet, like Coco and Luca and Sol and Turning Red. It it might be there again. But I think in the same way that to for a lot of Star Wars fans, it would it was like, okay, Force Awakens is very much the formula, but it's nice to see that they can do it. I think this would fit into a similar criteria of, yes, it is very much typical classic Pixar, but I want that. I will say this about Up and Wally, and this is for both films, more so Up because Up has more issues. I think if either of these movies were made today, they wouldn't be have the, like, I don't think it would have that quirk at the end of Wally where they go like, I'll go, Wally, no. I don't think it would have the old man fight. I think these movies, I think they have progressed to the point where they can look at these jokes and be like, no, that's cheap. Because I don't think Turning Red really has cheap jokes. I don't think Luca really has cheap jokes. And I think there are a lot, especially Luca, I think there's so many opportunities in Luca to go for a really dumb cheap joke. And I think it always keeps it grounded in its reality. I don't think, I don't think you get the old man fight and up today i think up today is probably a better movie which is logical anyway because you know that's how artists develop yeah yeah um but that also said i i i'm always a little iffy about defending soul because i haven't rewatched it and it's definitely the one where i feel like if i rewatched it of the recent one i would like it less um i think soul Soul does soul does kind of have that pete doctor instinct of like you know the why are the dogs here Soul has this entire act that's like cat jokes. Not, not it's not all cat <laughs> jokes, but they're like just cat jokes peppered in. Where it's like, huh? Like, yeah. What? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because that's what I was thinking whenever you first mentioned Soul. Is I was like, man, I saw Soul once, and it is to me a movie about what it is to be a cat. <laughs> and it's I like, think, I think Soul. Sh- there's is actually... obviously I love parts of Soul a lot, but that's my that was my big thing about the first watch of Soul. Is I was like, what? I would be really interested, and I'm not going to do it for this podcast, I'm not going to watch Soul again until we get to it on this podcast, but to watch Up and Soul back to back. Because I'm willing to bet a lot of the things I'll say about Soul will be very similar to Up, where it's like, I don't know about this cat stuff, but damn, that epiphany scene, right? Or, you know, like, stuff like that. I 100% think that will be my takeaway from rewatching Soul. But, yeah, right now it's like... I'm still going to stay positive on it. You know what? I spent $250 to watch that movie in the theater. So I'm going to pretend it was worth it. <laughs> now, I will say before we give the movie something, I do think, even though we mentioned it and we talked about it briefly, I do think we should once again give lip service to Michael Giacchino's score here. Because <sighs> um, it really is special. Beyond Married Life. I was also thinking of like the... Like the main theme that isn't married life. I think the music throughout this is so well utilized. And also it's what you want out of a score where the themes can be used again in like such an adventurous way, but also can make you cry in a moment. It's just such a, so many good themes. Like I think there's three or four really great themes in here and they're always utilized so well. This is probably Giacchino's best work ever. Probably Mark's fight and say he likes Mark's gonna fight and be like war for the planet of the apes man come on it it is I don't... easily up there but yeah damn <laughs> he really knows how to use a light motif in this you know what he knows how to use it well I don't know this this probably is not good music criticism either I had a thought though you know my thing about Ratatouille is that it's sometimes variations on the festine and then otherwise it's the it's the music from the incredibles in different forms Mm -hmm. sure so this is not exactly the same thing i don't even know what this means i hope that someone with a music background might be able to decode it but you know we have a music person coming on for our cards two episodes so when we talk about gichino then we can talk about it sorry come on are they (laughs) listening to the back are they're not the one listening to the episodes and then sending you messages no, about me are that's, they that's the guy we got okay. for our 50th which i don't I'm mind but it is funny to me <laughs> um, i'm glad someone's listening to our episodes um, <laughs> um <laughs> there's something i noticed listening to this movie because it has the big the, everyone knows the song married life and everyone knows the song le festine which is the ratatouille song but if you you can hear this, someone may prove me wrong, but 
there's the part in Mary Life that, that goes, da 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 which is, I think, the same as the part in the Ratatouille theme that goes, da 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 It's like the Ratatouille theme I is a syncopated that, version of this. It has... But, and I'm like, what am I hearing? It's the That's same interval. What's happening to me I'm these pretty, Giacchino scores? I'm pretty sure it's the yeah. same interval, but with... It's Other... the same interval, and I know, you know, you can't be like, you can reuse intervals and all that, but am I just like, am I imagining this? If that you listen it keeps to the, like... look, dude, I don't want to be like, you're, you, it's there, you're right, you're 100% right, it's there, but this is just, composers do this, <laughs> like, I, I think every composer does, like, I, I listen to the solo score, and it has, um, you know, bits of, uh, fuck it, what's his fucking name? John Powell. John Powell did Soul Score. It has some How to Train Dragon in it. The amount of times where I'm like, this song sounds exactly like this song. And everybody's like, what are you talking about? And then it turns out they don't sound the same. They just have one interval that's the same. And if it repeats enough, I my brain gets tricked into thinking they are the same song. Uh, I really need to hear his like other work in other things because I would just, I just, I feel like there's this like upbeat thing he does for Pixar movies that I'm I'm getting to like I'm no I know it too well. But Danny listens to the so many more scores than me and yeah. I'm a buffoon. My standards will always be warped by the fact that the endings of Somewhere That's Green and Part of Your World are the same ending and they knew it. Because Somewhere what, It's Green. Somewhere that's green from Little Shop of Horrors. Oh, I of course I know that, but like I don't, I just don't know that show that well. Yeah. But like, okay, so, yes. Thank, thank you for providing a perfect example of why <laughs> I am full of nonsense. No, it's is like it's one hundred percent like a thing that happens because that one, because Little Shop, it's far from Skid Row. I dream we'll go somewhere that's green and then you've got uh mm -hmm. part of your world which is you know out of the sea wish i could be part of that world and they yeah. called it the they called it something along the line like they made a joke ashman and menken that it was the same ending like they were so self-aware of that fact because there's only so many combinations, and if you already have aesthetic sensibilities that mm -hmm. you need to have to be a creative, you're going to create redundancies in your work eventually. Yeah, and nothing wrong with that. No. All right, so at the end of these episodes, we like to give the film something, like a lot of reviewers do, but unlike a lot of reviewers, we like to give the film a physical object, like a gift, or maybe it can be an experience, or just whatever your heart desires. Um, we usually like to go first to give the guests a feel for it. But I like that you you said you had a few. I have um, six, and I need to decide between them. Unless you will indulge me listing off all six. <laughs> I want to hear all six, actually. Okay. Well, sh okay. That will be unique. All right. Uh, the things I would give up. An old, worn VHS copy of The Sound of Music. The ball. Okay. Some chocolate. The ball? Oh. The ball. You know, fetch. Oh, okay. Well, you said the ball. I was like, what's the ball? <laughs> yeah, no. My bad. No, the tennis ball. That's that's a great gift. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Some chocolate. My arthritis medications. A bag of Werther's Originals. The ultimate old people candy. And whichever of the myriad of what is grief, if not love, persevering pieces I get recommended <laughs> every time I open Etsy. Somebody used to make that, but like put a picture of Kendall Roy next to it. Oh, uh, I'd buy that. <laughs> a shirt with Kendall Roy saying, what is grief, but not love, persevering. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very specific thing I would buy. <laughs> um... Uh, should I go or Mark? Do you have one? I have something. I'll, I don't know. I'll give something because yours are usually really good and mine are very off the cuff. Mine's kind of gonna... this time. I don't think it's that great, but go on. Well, it is whatever. I because you always justify yours and I never, I don't oh. like to. Um, <laughs> yeah. but 
Oh, now you're like, oh my god, this is gonna suck. I better come up with something good. But no, I'm no, gonna give it. I'm just sticking with all I got. I'm gonna give it like a quarter of a cup of olive oil, because when you're cooking, you can put all the ingredients in separately, and they can like retain some of their flavor. But I think one one of the deals about up is that um, these things are all kind of floating off around out in their own little world but they have oh you know what i should actually give up <laughs> i want to give up take it back to the olive oil <laughs> take it back no, no, <laughs> my no, olive no. oil well no 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 because i was going to give up an ingredient i was going to give up ingredients and let it do the work but i realized that i should do the work and give up a real gift i want to give up i want to give up the ratatouille that remy makes at the end of ratatouille because the way Remy makes ratatouille, it combines the best of both worlds. It has, it steams the vegetables so they retain their individual flavors, but it serves it on a bed of sauce, which is a pepperade that combines a lot of the vegetable flavors that normally you would cook ratatouille all together. But the way Remy makes it, he separates the ingredients. But that's maybe the best thing to give to up, which I think is strongest in some of its wacky different moments, but also, you know, brings them together. There's something there. Anyway, I want to give it that. Damn. So, at the end of the movie, we get a montage of their future, like a lot of these movies do. And one of the things we see is that Carl and Russell go see Star Wars. <laughs> so, what I'm going to do instead is give Carl and Russell tickets to Lincoln Center opening night IMAX of Oppenheimer. Because who better to tell a story to a man with a dead wife than Christopher Nolan? Wow. (laughs) (laughs) They never gave us that Pixar teaser trailer. It was like, one day, we all sat down after having a lunch, after watching Inception, and at this post-Inception lunch, we thought of a movie where a guy's wife dies. <laughs> I didn't imagine, like, a parody of the Wally trailer. <laughs> it's like, we thought about monsters who came into our world. We thought about toys that came to life. We thought about a robot who fell in love. And now we bring you a man whose wife has died. (laughs) (laughs) There's something there about that scene where it's Leonardo DiCaprio and Elliot Page, and he's like, "Draw me a map," but it's and then he gets draw me a house, and it's just the up house. It's a it's it's the up house. (laughs) All right. This was a great episode. Thank you for coming on, Tessa. Absolutely. I'm so medicated. <laughs> wow. Tessa, I had a great time. Plug yourself. From, oh, Where right. Where can people find you if they want to? You want if you want to be found. If you don't uh, want to be found, that's fine. Oh, mm-hmm. um, people, the or, thing that people would actually be interested in if they like hearing me talk about things for objectively too long would be my YouTube channel. It is my name. I make at least thirty videos a year usually all in one month i do veds with caleb every year vlog every day in september and i try to do more than just that last year i cataloged every new piece of media that i read watched listened to etc in all of 2022 i'm currently working on a project for the channel where i am uh (laughs) running statistics for every model on this show face off which is more complicated than you would ever imagine and yeah that's currently most of what i'm doing i'm writing a book but you can't see that yet and so the youtube channel is probably the best place to go nice awesome and yes awesome thank you so much (laughs) this was wonderful yeah Um, yeah it was a good time good talk yeah I'm glad we all dug into this movie. Like, Absolutely. Like... <laughs> I mean, it's like we said in the beginning, this is the movie that is like made to be dug into. Speaking of Doug, <laughs> Danny, what are we doing next week? 
Wow, that was, that actually was a pretty I, good I did a you. Holy Cause, shit. Because I was about to make a joke about Doug anyway, but you're like, oh, wait, that's actually what we're doing. Yeah, so next time, up, DVD, comes with a short, Doug Special Mission. Also, at the same time, on YouTube, Disney releases, or Pixar releases, I don't, I don't know which channel was put up on, the storyboards for the other short that was pitched, George and AJ. That's listed on Disney Plus now as a separate. It's crazy how you can watch George and Aging on Disney Plus, but not fucking Mr. Incredible and Pals with Commentary. What the heck? What of this is an actual <laughs> short? <laughs> bring, we're going to bring that up every time we can. Bring Mr. Incredible and Pals with Commentary to Disney Plus. <laughs> it needs to be seen. But you can watch George and AJ, and of course you can watch Doug's special mission there. We'll talk about both of them next time. So, yep. All right. Oh my god, we've got to read the credits. <laughs> yeah, we got credits now. Wow, wow, we wow, very nice. Uh, we didn't do this before. This is the first time doing this with a guest. Um, yeah, so Tessa, feel free to interrupt during this and make it exciting. Yeah, if you hear Wait, anything actually? you disagree with. <laughs> yeah, I don't care. It'll be fun. <laughs> as long as you don't cut off what we're actually saying, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. All right. All right. Looking for the Ocean. It's produced by Mark Young and Danny Vincent. The show is edited by Mark Young. Original you have a tough one this time. Was, nah, I, I, well, I, my internet, yeah. Our original <laughs> artwork was designed by Sarah Knopf. You can follow us on social media at look at Facebook at Looking for the Ocean, Instagram at Looking for the Ocean Pod, and at Twitter at Pixar Journey, where one of my favorite podcasts did not like the engagement I tried to do for this show. But they did like our snub club one, so I guess I went out. I guess that makes sense because their show's about Oscar snubs, so maybe you literally maybe lied about the, the my. You misrepresented one. me online. <laughs> well, I told uh, you. In retrospect, I realize you know the actual worst snub of all time is Jim Carrey for the Truman Show, but whatever. Anyway, you can also look at our website, <laughs> looking for the ocean, Pixar oh, You can follow me on markyoungperformer.com, and that has my socials on it, where you can see my true opinions about Oscar snubs. Did you actually quote tweet them with your worst snub? If not, you got no, because I didn't want to like fight them in fight you in front of them. Can be really funny though. Be like, this is, this, is, this is a lie. The worst time of all time is this. <laughs> Their social media manager gets to watch us fight, and they. Should... I mean, it's a very quick mute, honestly. Um, that was a very quick mute. Um, anyway, you can follow me, uh, Danny, on Letterbox at Blankmits for all my takes, all the movies, you know. The mecha, you know, that will also happen next week. I told Mark last time that when we didn't have a guest, I'd really get into my finals of mecha's rankings. So get excited for us breaking those down during the Doug episode at some point. It will happen. <laughs> um, we'll find, we'll find a time, we'll find a time to do it. Anyway, you can also listen to my other podcast, The Stuff Club, where we actually talk about Oscar stuff. So it's relevant for me to tweet at our podcast about Oscar stuffs. Uh, we talk about the movies that have the most Oscar nominations and no wins. <laughs> All right, Tessa, do you want to say goodbye to everyone? Have a good one, everybody.